Welcome back everyone. We will now have a public hearing on the council's intent to consider increasing FY22 general fund tax rate that exceeds the constant yield tax rate. Ms. Kennedy, can you please call on the first speaker? Yes, good afternoon. Our first speaker for this public hearing is Robin Ficker. Mr. Ficker, you will have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin as soon as you're ready. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Okay, I'm Robin Ficker, 16711 Barnesville Road, Boyds, Maryland. The council should have as its priority putting our children back in in person five days a week school. Black and Latino kids have been hurt the worst by closed schools. Instead, the council wants to increase county expenditures six times as fast as the increase in county tax revenue. Read the news. Headline 2016. Council passes 9% property tax hike. Headline 2016. Voters show disapproval by passing term limits with 70% of the vote. Headline 2018. Tax increase specialists elected in Montgomery County. Headline 2018, Amazon shuns Montgomery County and locates headquarters in Northern Virginia. Headline 2020, tax increase specialist Andrew Friedson pushes question A, allowing county to collect more property tax revenue. Council opposes question B, which limits property tax increases to the rate of inflation. Headline 2021, Council proposes property tax rate increase 4.7% higher than constant yield tax rate. Headline 2021, Council supports new digital tax scaring all high tech away. Headline yesterday, Apple shuns Montgomery County, approves billion dollar new campus in North Carolina, with 3,000 jobs averaging $185,000 annual salary, bringing $1.5 billion annually in new revenue, not to Montgomery County, but to Raleigh. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. President, I don't see any other speakers waiting on the line. So that wraps up the speakers for this public hearing. Great. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Uh, now, we the work session on the Ashton Village Center section plan was postponed. So now the council can have a work session on compensation and benefits for all agencies and the FY21 recommended operating budget covering five key issue areas. The FY22 budget and compensation context, the overview and analysis of FY22 agency requests for pay adjustments, retirement and group insurance, the other post-employment benefits pre-funding, an analysis of compensation cost sustainability and compensation related non-departmental accounts. Mr. Howard, can you lead us through? And I'll see if the, uh, and the, the government operations chair wants to add any remarks as well. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, not a lot to add other than to uh, point out that of course- Madam Chair, I'm sorry, I need to close the public oh. hearing. Thank you, please resume, my best. No problem. Um, <clears throat> traditionally, this is an item that goes to the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee, um, given our uh, framework as we are working through the budget um, this year because of the pandemic and the virtual uh, characteristics of our work. Uh, it has come to the full council. I do want to thank our staff for their analysis. I also want to thank um, our unions for uh, their work, as well as, of course, our employees. It goes without saying that uh, as we continue to reach particular milestones, like the one that we reached today, that uh, it is absolutely the case that our employees have been there every step of the way, making sure that our residents receive the kind of support uh, uh, and, and many times life-saving support um, that has, of course, uh, led to uh, us looking at numbers that look a lot better than many other jurisdictions. So it is important to recognize that. I will also say that um, there's no doubt that we do need to focus on our reviews of fiscal policies, given that 
within this particular um, these particular contracts, there are a few things that were included that we had discussed in the past and that we had agreed to in the past and a little bit of a departure. So we do need to come back and take a look at that more uh, firmly and with a little bit more time to deliberate uh, as well. Uh, in closing, I will say that, of course, this has been a budget um, that has that much more optimistic that we that we had anticipated. Um, and that uh, has a lot to do with um, the influx of funds that will be used uh, mostly for uh, one time expenditures, because a lot of them are tied to the ARPA funding, um, et cetera. So it is important also to recognize that and to think about what we will be doing in the next couple of years to ensure that our fiscal standing is strong. Many of the things that we are going to consider today, many of those decisions that we're gonna to consider today to be these contracts really are predicated on the fact that we had to make some very difficult decisions during the last recession. And, and subsequent to that, we kept a lot of promises that were not easy to do. Um, but at the same time, uh, we need to continue to do that. We need to be mindful of that. Um, so whatever decisions we are going to make, let's uh, remember that there are all are many other components within the budget as well as our fiscal policies that we will have to continue to strengthen. Um, with that, Mr. President, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Howard. Thank you very much and good afternoon, Council members. And, and thank you um, both uh, Council President and the Chair of the GEO Committee for that great introduction. Um, there's nothing that I can say that is uh, would be more uh, more helpful than what you've already said. So, and Mr. Trump and I will will get going on our presentation. Um, as always, there's a very thick staff staff report for this uh, for this item, but we will go through and try to hit just some of the key highlights um, as we walk through the packet. We're also joined um, by different representatives from the executive branch and from um, the labor unions for the question and answer period um, afterwards. And we want to thank them as well as our partners from the um, the other county agencies for helping us prepare the information um, and materials that are, are needed for us to um, put together this packet. Um, and so today we're going to go through the, the presentation and then after we're done or at the very end, I'll walk through the staff's recommendations um, for these items and the council will take initial straw votes on these compensation and benefit items. Um, they're included in this packet, but decisions on the provisions in the negotiated collective bargaining agreements will be made um, separately as part of the next agenda item led by Mr. Drummer. So on that note, I will just begin by noting that on page one of our staff report, um, we do include information as we do each year on the FY21 approved and FY22 requested tax supported compensation costs by agency. Um, across the agencies, employee compensation costs comprise about 80% of all agency expenditures. Um, and as, as we've um, had several discussions with the council over the years, that the cost of government um, is driven by both the number of employees and the cost per employee. So for FY22, the county funded agencies have requested about $3.6 billion in employee compensation costs, uh, which represents a 1.7% increase over FY21. Um, We'll be talking today about the county government. Um, uh, you know, we're making decisions today about county government um, compensation, and then the other agencies, MCPS, the college, and park and planning, um, their respective boards will make final decisions on their compensation um, agreements and, and adjustments after the final budgets are approved by the council. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Tronka to walk through the pay adjustment section. Thank you. So we'll continue our walk through on page two of the memo. And on page two, you'll see a table that summarizes the FY22 pay increases recommended by the county executive for the county government. Starting with the general wage adjustments, you'll see that the negotiations with FOP yielded a 2.5% um, GWA and with IAFF a 1.5% GWA. For McGeo and for the non-represented employees, there's a little different approach this year. There's a flat rate of $1,684 per employee as a general wage adjustment. And we'll give a little bit more details about that in a minute. The service increments are about three and a half percent for all those who are eligible. Past your service increment for McGeo, there's a 1.25% um, increment for those employees who are on the payroll in FY11, but received no increment that year because of the reg revenue shortfall. 
The executive recommends funding for all of the longevity incre increments as listed in the table. And the McGeo agreement also includes a lump sum payment of $600 for members who are not eligible for an FY22 service increment, such as those at, at top of grade. Before we leave this table, it's important to note that all of the GWAs, except for those for, for FOP, take effect at the very end of the fiscal year. So moving on to page three, a little bit more detail on the general wage adjustments, specifically that $1,684. Again, we mentioned this is a non-traditional approach. In the traditional approach, where it would have, where the dollars would have been spread equally among as as a, as a constant percent among all employees, the 1.684 dollars translates to about a 2.4 percent salary increase for McGeo members and about a one and a half percent increase for non-represented employees. But of course, a flat dollar amount is a higher percent pay increase for lower salaried employees than it is for higher salaries. Employees. We give the example in our memo of this 1684 being about 4.2% pay increase for an employee at $40,000, while a 1.7% pay increase for an employee at $100,000. So you can see the progressive nature of the of a flat dollar amount. We do note, though, that if, if this approach were to occur year after year, it could result in salary compression um, along the salary scale. Also want to note a provision in the IAF um, contract. It's a conditional provision that requires the executive to submit a supplemental appropriation to raise the GWA for IAF members from 1.5% to as high as 2.25% contingent on the consumer price index. If the consumer price index, the CPI, exceeds 1.5, the contract requires the executive to sub submit that supplemental appropriation. Jumping to page four of the of the packet, there's a discussion of the performance pay based pay. This is for employees in the MLS Management Leadership Service and PLS, the Police Leadership Service. Um, and these employees receive performance based pay in lieu of service increments. Now, if you think back to the action you took last month on the FY21 pay increases, MLS and PLS employees did not receive performance based pay increases in FY21. But the executive's budget does include funding for performance based pay for these employees covering two years, both FY21 and FY22. I'm going to move on to page five and discuss two sick leave provisions that are in the executive's recommendation. One regards the IFF. And so currently, IF members receive credited service towards their pension for whole units of 106, 176 hours or a month worth of unused sick leave. But there's no partial credit for units of less than 176 hours. The new provision in the IAFF contract would allow that unused sick leave in, in units less than 176 hours be converted into cash and credited to a member's deferred compensation account. There's also a sick leave provision, a new sick leave provision negotiated with McGeo, specifically for those members in the RSP and GRIP retirement plans. And that would provide that for employees when they leave county service, if they have at least 10 years of service and a sick leave balance of 120 hours, they'd receive a payment of $5,000. And employees with at least 20 years of service and a balance of 240 hours would receive $10,000 payment at the end of their service. And the executive has, has indicated that he plans to extend this, this pay, payment program to non-represented employees in the RSP and the GRIP. And so staff is noting here on the middle of page five that these proposals of sick leave crediting for IFF and sick leave payment pro, pro, uh, payouts for McGeo and non-representative, they do represent significant policy changes that, that count, council members should be aware of. And at least the extension of the sick leave payout program to non-representatives would require an amendment to the personnel regulations. There are other miscellaneous pay and benefits um, that were negotiated by the executive with the bargaining units, and those are all listed in Mr. Drummer's memorandum on the collective bargaining agreements. I'd now like to direct your attention to the table on page six, which shows the cost of the pay adjustments, and it'd be helpful just to look at the bottom line of the table, where you'll see that the FY22 cost of the pay, county government pay adjustments recommended by the executive is about $16.7 million about 13 million of that is tax supported. 
But as we noted before, many of the pay adjustments take effect at the end of the fiscal year. And so the budgeted amount of F for FY22 does not really reflect the full co annualized cost. And by annualized cost, what we're referring to is the 12 month cost, what these would cost over, over a full, full year. The full annualized cost is about $39.4 million, of which about 30.8 of that is, is tax supported. So you can see that the annualized cost is really about two and a half times greater than the FY22 costs. And what, what council members need to note is that these costs will become part of the base budget in FY23 and all subsequent years, and that the full annualized costs will, will have to be paid um, with ongoing revenues, not with one-time revenues, um, as was referenced by Ms. Navarro at, at the beginning of, the, of our session. Jumping to page seven of the packet, we have a brief summary of pay increases for other agencies. For MCPS, please note that the board recently completed its FY21, that's FY21 negotiations with its within employees union. And if that is, or if those agreements are ratified, employees would receive a 2.0% general wage in, um, adjustment and increments averaging about three and a half per, percent. But it's important to note that MCPS and its employee units have not yet begun negotiations for FY22, and those costs are still to be determined. For Montgomery College, in the current year, in FY21, most college employees received a GWA ranging from 2.3 to 3%, but the FY22 operating budget submitted by the college includes no funding for pay adjustments. Park and planning. Their budget for FY22 has currently has a placeholder of about $2.3 million for um, employee pay increases. And the commission is still currently negotiating with its bargaining units with McGeo and with FOP. Now, many of you are aware that last week, the planning board chair Anderson sent a letter to the council president. And the key part of that message is in the second par paragraph in italics on page eight where the chair states that if, if parking planning were to negotiate pay agreements similar to those of the county government, they would need to increase their budget request by up to two and a half million dollars. For WSSC, because of revenue short shortfalls, their employees receive no cost splitting adjustment or no merit increases in FY21, and they're not slated to receive um, either of those increases in FY22 either. There were one-time payments of $1,250 in FY21 and a plan for $750 um, one-time payment in FY22. And finally, WSSD has a flexible worker program that awards monetary awards for, for, as an incentive for outstanding performance. They suspended this program in FY21, and I want to clarify something in our packet that while the program is going to be reinstated in FY22, the package should have clarified that those wage increases will take effect, not in FY22, but in FY23. Pages 9 and 10 of the packet discuss county government retirement costs. In some, the, the costs for the various retirement programs are about $70 million in FY22 for the, for the county government. And the table on page 10 compares the cost per employee for different retirement plans. Moving on to the bottom of page 10 for MCPS, there are two pension elements, two in the, in the MCPS budget. For FY22, there, the MCPS's own pension will cost about $68 million, and that's the core pension benefit for the non-teachers and the supplemental pension for all employees. But there's also another about $62 million that goes to the state pension fund to pay for the core benefit for teachers. Now I'd like to jump ahead in the packet to the bottom of page 11. And you have asked us, you asked staff annually to do a cost sustainability analysis, which Craig and I have done again this year. What's changed is that last month, the council adopted resolution uh, 19753, where you codified a policy on sustainability of county government compensation costs. And in sum, what that policy states is that the goal of having annual growth rate of total compensation costs be similar to the annual growth rate of tax supported revenues. And if those rates differ, the policy asks for the executive to explain how those increases would be supported either by new revenues or other ex or reductions in other expenditures. So looking at the numbers for FY22, as you saw on the first page of the packet, 
the executive recommends compensation costs growing by 3.2%. But the revenues for this upcoming year are projected to grow by only 0.8%. And so the compensation growth rate is about four times greater that than that of the revenue growth rate. And even if you look at a multi-year approach from FY22 to FY27, Compensate a revenue would grow by about 2.4%, which is still only three quarters of the compensation growth uh, increase for by the proposed by the executive. So these numbers trigger the requirement for the executive to respond. And we did receive a response um, in the last couple of days, and that's included in the addendum to your packet that you should have received in the last couple of days. The executive observes that much of the FY22 cost increase is the result of really the FY21 pay increase that were approved late in the fiscal year and were annualized into FY22. And we note that this is a correct uh, uh, observation, but we're also noting that the FY22 costs will have a greater long-term cost impact because the GWAs proposed for FY22 also take effect later in the year late in the fiscal year, and we'll spill over into FY23 and beyond. With that, I'll turn it back to Mr. Howard to talk about group insurance. Thank you very much. So now we're on page 13 of the packet. And uh, first we'll talk about the group insurance for active employees. And so the FY22 tax board request um, across all four agencies totals uh, 420.4 million, which is an increase of 4.6% from FY21. And in total, the uh, group insurance spending represents about 8% of, of all tax supported spending for, for active employee group insurance. There are no significant changes to group insurance plans um, from any of the agencies, but from a funding perspective, I do want to note that both county government and MCPS have been able to keep costs down um, a bit in the past two fiscal years by drawing down on fund balance. And a lot of this is due to uh, lower than anticipated use of health care during uh, the COVID pandemic. So that will be something to look at to see how health care claims, um, whether they rise to the pre-pandemic levels or whether they stay a little bit below um, in the next few fiscal years. I do want to note that for the county government budget, the executive uh, does include funding for a different group insurance cost share for two groups of employees, the FOP and the IAFF employees. In FY11, the council approved a group insurance cost share split of 75-25 uh, for all employees, excluding HMO medical plans, which stayed at 80-20. And each year since then, the council has reconfirmed that policy um, as part of its budget actions. However, the collective bargaining uh, agreements with the county's unions um, have not changed, have not been amended to reflect this change. And so for FY22, the executive does include funding for an 80-20 cost share for IAFF and FOP employees due to the language in the collective bargaining agreements. Um, McGeo did agree to the funding, the cost share at 75-25 in a side letter. Um, and so as when this has occurred in the past, the council has rejected uh, these changes and maintained the same 75-25 cost share for all employees. And if the council does this again, the, uh, it will result in a reduction to the executive's budget of about 1.46 million. For MCPS, um, I do want to note that um, as you know, in the past several years, the council has encouraged MCPS to align its cost share uh, for active employees with that of county government. And if MCPS did so, it would result in estimated annual savings in the range of $25 million. At the bottom of page 14, we start with information on the group insurance for retirees. And there's two components to this. There's the pay-as-you-go funding to pay the um, annual claims for retired employees. And then there's the OPEB pre-funding. Uh, taken together, the tax board funding for retiree group insurance accounts for about 3.5% of all tax board spending in FY22. Um, so first for the pay-as-you-go funding, the FY22 tax supported request totals $89.2 million, which is a 4.4% increase from the FY21 levels. And there are no significant changes to the design or structure of retiree health benefits um, across any of the agencies. OPEB pre-funding information begins at the bottom of page 15 and going on to page 16. Um, and the executive recommends $92.1 million in tax supported OPEB pre-funding in FY22. And the key point is this um, amount fully meets the actuarially determined contributions for each agency. On page 16, we provide an updated table on the current agency OPEB liabilities, assets, and funded ratio. And you can see that the total uh, estimated OPEB liability 
across the four agencies is now about $5.1 billion. And the agencies combined have put away about $1.3 billion or 25% of the total OPEB, OPEB liability. Um, so when you compare that to previous years, the funded ratio is improving slowly but steadily, but of course there is still a long way to go as we've only um, put aside 25 cents for every dollar that we owe in the future. On page 17, there's information on agency group insurance um, funds. And the, the key data point here is that, especially due to the uh, reduced healthcare usage in FY21, all the agencies anticipate ending FY21 with group insurance fund balances at or above the 5% um, uh, policy target in the, in the council's uh, resolution 15-454. And on page 18, we have information on the uh, different compensation related NDAs. The first one is the compensation and employee benefits adjustments NDA. And the recommended amount for this NDA is $5.6 million in FY22, which is a significant increase from the FY21 budgeted amount. And this results from, um, from two actions. The first is there's a big increase related to the MLS PLS pay for performance um, funding. Half of that is the, um, the increase by the executive to do the two years of funding. And the other piece of it is because we, the, the council reduced that, um, that NDA last year when it did not provide any, any uh, funding for that, um, that item. And the second piece is the 1.4 million for the um, health insurance cost share adjustment is in that NDA. The other NDAs, the Consolidated Retiree Health Benefits Trust and the Group Insurance, uh, those NDAs reflect the dollar amounts for the um, uh, retiree health insurance that I, I mentioned earlier. And then there's a couple more NDAs related to state positions that are um, small dollar amounts every year and again in FY22. And I'll turn it back over to Aaron for the next section. So very briefly, pages 19 through 21 show the administrative and management costs for the county's retirement plans, deferred compensation, and the consolidated health benefit trust. Not going to walk through those, these pages, just let you know that the costs are very stable. And I think I saw you yeah, have Linda Herman on the, on the Zoom. We have to note that she and her team have done a really excellent job controlling the costs of these administrative costs for these um, different funds. And it actually helped offset lower than anticipated investment returns this year. So the counties stayed stable because of, because of their good work. Um, I think that's, that's it for these four pages. I'll turn it back to Mr. Howard. Great, thank you. And so our last section is beginning on page 23 is the, is the uh, staff recommendations. And I'll, I'll go through um, each of these sections and after the, the questions and answer period when the council is ready to, to take these up, you can um, take them up either as a one block or you can take each section up individually. Um, so first in section A is the FY22 pay and benefit adjustments. And again, we know that the executive has recommended um, costs that can be funded by available FY22 revenues. However, for the reasons Aaron mentioned earlier, the compensation package does have uh, uh, concerns related to long-term sustainability. And the decisions on the compensation provisions in the collective bargaining agreements will be made as part of the next item, um, as I mentioned earlier. And historically, the council has supported equity and pay and benefit adjustments for non-represented employees um, based on the final decisions that are made on the collective bargaining agreements. So aside from the action on those, which will occur in, in as I said, the next item, we do have three policy recommendations related to, um, uh, to pay and benefits. And the first is that in conjunction with the ongoing review and update of fiscal policies, um, that the council should also consider review, reviewing policies and practices that impact long-term compensation cost sustainability. Um, one piece of this is on the revenue side, which is some of that has already begun with a, a review of how revenues are estimated for the budget and also a lot of the economic development work that is uh, ongoing um, in the council is so potentially big impacts on the revenue side. And then on the expenditure side, we can look at some of the potentially look at some of the topics such as size of the workforce, that, which the executive has been working on, um, as well as when in the fiscal year compensation adjustments take effect structure of wage adjustments for both represented and non-represented employees and other things like that. And the goal is to help the county continue to provide pay and benefits needed to attract and retain a first-class workforce, while at the same time ensuring salary and benefit levels remain viable even in times of fiscal uncertainty. Uh, the second area is to revisit benefit plans, costs, and funding across all county-funded agencies. The council has already requested staff to return to work on updating OPEP policies, which we will begin um, post-budget, 
Um, and another uh, option is to resume conversations with MCPS about their benefit provisions. Um, and part of that is in line with the um, reexamination in the context of the current legislation and some of the, the changes that that makes um, for the structure of, um, uh, of pay and benefits for MCPS employees going forward. And the last policy recommendation is that as part of the council's annual budget resolutions, the council should indicate that current compensation decisions are limited to those recommendations that are currently before the council and in their final form. The council should retain its right and obligation to review and make decisions at a future date about any provisions that are not um, yet fully developed or that are condition contingent upon uncertain future events. Additionally, we recommend um, including a provision that any emergency pay differential um, and FY22 would require approval of the council via a supplemental appropriation. The next section is uh, section B is the group insurance recommendations and staff recommends supporting the agency's FY22 tax supported requests, excluding the cost share for FOP and IAFF employees, which I'll get to in a minute in section D, uh, supporting the agency's tax supported pay as you go uh, retiree employee costs, as well as the OPEB prefunding supporting the recommended FY22 projection for the county government's employee health benefits self-insurance fund and encouraging MCPS to uh, take further efforts to align its cost share with that of county government. Section C is the recommendations for retirement. Um, staff recommends approving the recommended county contributions for, the, um, for each of the, the retirement plans, approving the administrative and operating budgets for the retirement plans, continuing to monitor the funded ratio of the agency's pension funds, and also encourage MCPS to achieve savings and retirement costs as previously discussed. And the last is section D for the compensation related NDAs. Staff recommends approving the NDAs for OPEB prefunding, a group insurance for retirees, uh, the employee retirement plans, state position supplement, and the state retirement contribution NDA. And then for the compensation and benefits adjustment NDA, Approve the executive's recommended funding, except for the 1.4 million included for the changes in the group insurance cost share. And that council will act on that item as part of its decision on the collective bargaining agreements um, in, in the next item with Mr. Drummer. And with that, that is a uh, summary of, of all things compensation and benefits and, and, and then some. And we'll turn it back over to you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, thank you both for that great summary. And colleagues, okay, Councilmember Friedson. Uh, thank you, Council President. Thank you, uh, staff, uh, for uh, a really helpful report. Thanks to our neighbor partners for joining us here. Um, I had uh, some particular questions uh, on the uh, sick leave uh, crediting. I was hoping we could just uh, flush that out a bit. Um, and uh, some of the questions are uh, related to uh, our staff and, and, and perhaps uh, uh, Mr. Drummer related to you know, what would be needed, wouldn't be needed. And I see we have Mr. Buttle here. So perhaps uh, he could help clarify Ms. Bryant uh, on behalf of the executive branch. Um, my understanding about this provision is that the firefighters have worked out with the executive branch in the agreement to develop legislation that they will be sending over to the council uh, that we would have to approve. Ultimately, uh, that legislation, uh, the agreement uh, is to uh, approve it before uh, the end of fiscal year 22 and will go effect, go in effect once that uh, legislation is approved by the council. At that point, that would be the point at which there would be a cost associated. Uh, with uh, this provision. Until that occurs, there is no cost uh, associated uh, with that provision. And so um, I just would like to get clarification that that is the case. Generally, the council is approving or rejecting funding uh, and appropriations related to the uh, agreements. Uh, and so I just wanted to get clarification. Uh, perhaps I could start with Mr. Buttle, uh, if that is uh, accurate based on how I've described it, that um, the agreement that you have with the county executive to develop legislation and uh, you know at least in principle move in this direction for council approval that that is not currently associated with a funding requirement an appropriation requirement in fiscal year 22. 
Uh, Council member, that's correct. The agreement that we have with the executive is to uh, submit legislation because it would re, uh, require a, a change in the retirement uh, code. Uh, the executive would have to submit that legislation prior to June 30th of 2022. Uh, if it gets introduced in, in June of 2022, uh, we all know from a practical uh, sense, we're probably talking well into the fall, uh, just going through the, the normal legislative hoops. But as of today, uh, there is no legislation uh, because the executive has until next June to do that. Uh, so there's not any funding uh, required uh, at this time until that, that legislation is introduced. And then, of course, uh, it would have to go through the normal uh, legislative process with the council. Thank you, uh, Ms. Quill. appreciate that clarification. It, could someone from council staff just uh, respond and, and ensure that everybody's on the same page, that that is the the view of council staff as well, that this does not uh, include a funding obligation? Uh, yeah, I, you know, unfortunately, I, I Zoom crashed um, while Mr. Buttle was speaking. Uh, but we're, we're talking about the pension enhancement provision in the IAFF agreement. Uh, that requires both legislation and an actuarial evaluation to look at not just the costs for this year, but for the next six years. Uh, without that, it, it's nothing that the council, not, nothing that the council can actually uh, approve. I mean, you need to, uh, my recommendation is you need to not approve it, uh, and make it clear that the executive can come back sometime during the year with his legislation and a supplemental appropriation and you can consider it, but that there'd be no money in the budget this year for any increase because you don't even know how much it would be. Um, Thanks. Based on my understanding, it, it seems like there's less disagreement and conflict here than, uh, you know, perhaps uh, the, you know, the recommendation suggests. Is there an issue either by you, Mr. Drummer, or from you, Mr. Buttle, if there's just clarifying language to, to affirmatively state that there is no appropriation in FY22, in fiscal year 22, for this provision, which would, which would reflect exactly what, Mr. Buttle, you have shared with us and would ensure that there isn't any confusion on whether or not the council is making decision before we have the legislation and before we go through the standard process as, as has been agreed to between the executive and the firefighters, which really the council is not part of at, at this point until there's a, a policy change or an appropriation related. I mean, our view at this point is we don't have legislation that's been introduced to the, to the council. The, the only thing so because this requires a change in the retirement law in the Montgomery County Code, uh, that can only be done via legislation. The only agreement we have with the executive is to introduce legislation to the council prior to June 30th of next year. It would then be up to the council whether they pass it, reject it, amend it, do whatever it is that they want. So we don't view that there's an appropriation required today from the council. Um, and then, you know, some of the actuarial stuff that Mr. Drummer is referencing, um, that's part of the reason that we agreed with the executive to push the date out um, so that between now and, and next June, you know, we can go through all of those, um, you know, necessary steps so that when a piece of legislation uh, gets introduced to the council, it can come with all the information. Uh, and, and finally, I'll, I'll just say there's also a caveat in there uh, that while we have a, a tentative agreement on what the legislation will look like, uh, there is a provision in there that the county executive and the union president uh, can agree to alter that to something else if through the actuarial studies uh, and things of that nature, um, you know, uh, you know, if, if we both agree that, uh, you know, we should send it over in, in a format that would be maybe something less uh, or whatever it may be. Uh, but we don't believe that today uh, there is any funding decision required by the council because no legislation has been introduced and the only thing that the side letter requires is that before June 30th of next year, the council introduced or the uh, county executive introduced the legislation. 
Got it. So the question is whether whether the uh, budget resolution would be silent on this issue, which you think you know would be appropriate, or whether there would be clarifying language just to note, you know, reflecting what you've just shared that there's no fiscal year 22 appropriation for this provision in the collective bargaining agreement. Again, I don't think there's huge disagreement between those two uh, issues, but that seems to me the, the question. I think if you you know, going into this conversation, if you're reading the packet, it may have seemed more, uh, more of a conflict here than it, than I believe it actually is. Yeah, I, I think you need to uh, make it clear because there is a provision in the collective bargaining agreement uh, that's in front of you that there's a potential legislation coming for a pension enhancement for the. IAFF members and actually the fire and rescue group G. But, uh, it, you know, so I think the budget resolution ultimately needs to state that there's no appropriation for this. That doesn't mean there couldn't be a supplemental during the year, but there shouldn't be any, any indication that the council is somehow a, okay with this pending seeing the legislation. It should be the council has put no money in the budget for this and it will require legislation and a supplemental. Based on the timeline that Mr. Buttle just shared with us, there is a chance that this doesn't even come up in fiscal year 22, that the funding might not even begin, even if all things go according to the agreement uh, set forth between the executive and the, the union. Uh, you know, the, the funding may not even be required until FY23. So, Mr. Buttle, do you have any concerns if there's just clarifying language to reflect that there's no appropriation in this fiscal year 22 budget for that particular item? Yeah, uh, the only thing, other thing I'd like to note is that the council would ultimately control the effective date of the legislation when the legislation comes before them. So, even if the county executive sent it over in, say, September, the council would be free in the legislative process to determine the effective date through the legislative process. I still don't believe because there is not a piece of legislation that inter that is introduced that it doesn't require any action one way or the other by the council. If the council at the time the legislation is introduced doesn't want to make it effective in FY22, this council could simply control that by pushing the effective date to somewhere past FY22. So I'm I'm still confused, I guess, by uh, why it is that it needs uh, action one way or the other right now. It needs action because it's in the agreement. You know, this is unusual to see something in the agreement that we've agreed to send you uh, some sort of wage or benefit enhancement in the future, but we're not going to tell you what it is uh, because we don't know yet. And it will figure it out sometime during the year. I mean, the council sets a budget for the year. In, in May, you'll set a budget for the entire year. And that's when you set the budget. You don't set it in. You don't have, I mean, there are obviously there can be supplementals and special appropriations during the year, but it has to come in that form. So the problem is that there's something in the agreement where the executive has agreed to some sort of pension enhancement and the council is faced with that. That's why something needs to be done. Something needs to be considered in, in the budget resolution. And I think the result is the same. If the council says, you know, there's no money in the budget for this, the executive can still send over the legislation during the year along with a supplemental appropriation and the council will consider it. Uh, yeah, I forgot to Member, yield my time. Oh, sorry, Mr. Butler, if you want to. I was a council member. Let, let me suggest this because I don't want to get hung up on this. Um, I, I'm okay if the council, if you want to make a note, I, you know, I don't know how this would work with uh, inside your process here today, but, you know, if, if the if the legislation comes over during the fiscal year and council would choose um, to implement it sometime during the fiscal year, which would be, of course, be uh, under the control of the council, I'm okay if, if uh, you know, if council wants to say, you know, if it's implemented this fiscal year, it would also require a supplemental appropriation because you're not approving anything now. So to the extent that the council would, would want to implement it before the end of the fiscal year, it would require both the legislation and a supplemental. I'm, I'm okay if, 
if, if that's what you want to state, because I think that's what would have to happen. Appreciate that. I, I think that, I mean, to me, it's, it's like belts and suspenders here. I think, uh, I think the suggestion is if we just say that there's nothing appropriate in the fiscal 22 budget, that would require the supplemental appropriation, which is what would be required anyway. Uh, and I think it's just the, the clarification, uh, you know, that is being suggested by, by staff. Again, I, I think it's belts and suspenders. I tend to agree with you, Mr. Buttle, that it's not a funding uh, agreement. I understand what council staff is suggesting that, uh, you know, if there's confusion on this, that the council has not, uh, you know, taken a position uh, on uh, what is ultimately going to be sent over to us. And so it would just be clarifying. Uh, that point, uh, you know, so I'm not going to make a formal motion here. I would just suggest that, you know, the clarifying language seems to be consistent. I'm not sure that it's totally necessary, but at the same time, I'm not sure it would interfere in any way with your continued negotiations with the executive and ultimately sending over legislation that may or may not require a supplemental depending on, uh, you know, when it, it, it gets sent over to us. So that, that would be my you, but I'll, I'll yield back to the president and I'm not making a formal motion, but if there are others, I'd certainly be comfortable with, that, you know, clarifying language as a belts and suspenders uh, tactic here. Thank you. Right. I, I mean, we have time. I don't, I don't see any problem with clarifying language uh, that we could adopt in time for reconciliation. My, Mr. Buttle, uh, thank you for being here. Can you yes. clarify? The, the the other I just want to speak to the other piece that I thought was sort of missing from this analysis is um, the unused sick leave to deferred compensation in Article 51. The goal of that is to end up addressing our long-standing, long-deferred problem with fire overtime, right? Uh, that is correct. Yes, I know, Council. Uh, uh, the public safety chair and I are the only ones who here who have had to sit through six years of. Um, public safety committee hearings about this. And I remember our, our staff uh, appropriately flagging the mounting costs of uh, fire and rescue overtime year after year after year. And I remember public safety chair Elrich saying, next year is the year we're gonna do something about this. And some of us urged him to do something uh, to reach some accommodation uh, more expeditiously. But now that you've been at the table, isn't that the, wasn't that the driver behind this? to save us money on overtime by allowing you to use sick leave and put that into deferred compensation? Yeah, and just to clarify, this is a separate provision from what we were just talking about with uh, right. Council Member Freitz, and this does have a fiscal note assigned to it. Um, yes, the uh, the intent behind it was to um, allow employ or uh, give the employees um, the ability to roll over into their deferred compensation program uh, unused sick leave that other, otherwise could not be credited uh, towards their retirement credits, uh, which are done in one month increments. And the idea and premise behind it, uh, Mr. President, is uh, exactly right and exactly what you said. Um, where uh, MCFR saves in their budget uh, is they don't have to incur the time and a half backfill right. in addition to paying an employee who's off work on sick leave. Thank you, because I'm getting old and I don't trust my memory anymore, but I, I'm scarred by all those public hearings and I see the public safety chair nodding, so I think I'm not far afield. So where's the analysis of the savings um, from the overtime we've been paying year after year after year that every year we say we're going to do something about and there's a solution, I think, negotiated in front of us here? Yeah, so I can I can certainly uh, break it down in simplistic terms. I don't know if the executive branch um, uh, has a response a as well. Uh, but we we did an analysis um, of of the FY19 sick leave cost. That was the last full fiscal year we had uh, when we were in negotiations. And on average, the uh, the hourly cost the uh, the regular hourly rate for an employee uh, is 33.61, and overtime is 50.41. So the difference is uh, basically for every hour of sick leave that is not used the county would save uh, $50 per hour, approximately $50 per hour, because they're not incurring the time and a half backfill to backfill the position for the employee that's on sick leave. How much did we spend on fire and rescue overtime last year? Oh, it was uh, off. The, it was over 20 million, well over 20 million, if I recall. Mr. Yeah. Trump, did you, did Mr. Howard, Mr. Trump, did you assess how much we might save if we adopt this provision? So we actually asked the executive branch for any formal information on expected savings from overtime and 
their response and their, they can clarify because they're obviously here was that um, they did not anticipate this necessarily saving money in overtime. Yes. Yeah, so, so to be clear, there is a provision in the agreement that would, is, um, this is Rachel Silverman from OMB, um, that would create a work group um, effective in the, in the interim year to take a deep dive into the impacts of some of these provisions and other changes that could be made um, to the pension system for Group G and look at the viability of those changes. And part of that analysis would be, you know, taking a deep analysis of the impacts of savings um, but as you might imagine, there are a number of assumptions that you'd have to make in terms of uh, what the impacts would be. And so that would be part of that work. We can't just implement this. We have to have a work group for a year. Well, I think part of the idea of deferring um, the implement or the proposal of the legislation would be to look at that change, you know, in, in concert with other changes that could be made to the pension to make sure that we're not um, looking at any unanticipated consequences as a, as a result of the proposal. I think the 20 million we're spending on overtime is an unanticipated consequence. I mean, this is why people make fun of Montgomery County for having work groups and not making decisions. Council Vice President Albert Nose. Um, just I'm super confused. Uh, so so I'm, I'm going to try to uh, break these down in three buckets um, if I can. Uh, one is uh, a discussion before regarding what's before us right now, uh, which is there's nothing before us right now. <laughs> um, but but there but there is in the agreement, as Mr. Drummer acknowledged, um, an element or, or a component that says that, you know, there, there will be something. Uh, that the executive will be required to introduce legislation, um, at, you know, before the end of this fiscal year. I get all that. Uh, now I'm a little confused that that there's a work group that's going to work on determining the cost benefit analysis of that uh, on a parallel track when there's already been a commitment that legislation is going to be introduced. So I'm not entirely sure what this work, it sounds like it's baked, uh, that, that the executive has agreed that this is the uh, a, a, a smart path forward to, to make savings, uh, and, and there's a commitment in the agreement that there will be an introduction of legislation. But now I just heard Ms. Silverman say that there hasn't been an assessment of a cost-benefit analysis. So that there, there's something incongruent there that I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding. Um, and then with regards to what we're doing right now, um, and I appreciate Councilmember Fritzen uh, trying to get to a, to, to a point where, you know, just some clarification language, because it sounds like, um, to, to Mr. Drummer's point, this has to be acknowledged in some way in his opinion. Um, and, and, and I think the debate is how it would be acknowledged uh, in what we're discussing today. Um, but I, I'm just, I'm having a hard time figuring out what, what exactly we're, we're, we are or are not voting on uh, with regards to this. And then it's, and then, and now just based on Ms. Silverman's comments, I have a series of questions on what process the executive branch is gonna follow to arrive at the introduction of legislation in the first place. But I'm not sure that this is the time and place for us to have that conversation because uh, it is an agreement between the executive branch and um, IAFF, um, but there is undeniably in the agreement a commitment that uh, legislation is going to be introduced. So, so there there is a little bit of a discrepancy here. Yes. So there there is the commitment that we will put forward legislation by the end of the fiscal year. But there is also provision that you know um, in in concert and working with um, the IAFF, if there is mutual agreement not to move forward with um, with the legislation or to change the contents of the legislation, you know, that that could be done. Okay, so the work group may adjust what ultimately ends up in the legislation, but the legislation will still, there's a commitment that it will be introduced, but the, ram of the, the parameters of it, the details of it, are what this work group is gonna work out. Correct. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Um, Mr. Vice President, if I could maybe clarify, because I understand where you're confused. What Council Member Friedson was talking about um, is a provision uh, where we agreed with the executive to submit certain legislation to increase the value of un unused sick leave 
towards actual pension credit. So that'll come later. It's not even before the council right now. That'll become later. What the council president asked me about was a provision that is before you. Uh, there is a fiscal note that is attached to it, but to the council president's point, while there might be a fiscal note attached, we believe where the savings is, is that uh, MCFRS has taken the position that uh, when somebody calls out or takes sick leave, it requires them the substantial majority of the time to backfill um, at time and a half on overtime. Where we believe the benefit to the county is, is that, you know, if somebody does not use their sick leave, that MCFRS does not incur the time and a half backfill. That particular provision, which is in the packet, does not require legislation because it's just simply we negotiated with the executive of what can be done with unused leave upon retirement or exit from the drop. So what council member Hucker was asking and what council member Friedson was talking about are actually two very separate issues. Um, and what the, the work group is going to focus on a lot of stuff, but one of the things, uh, you know, on the legislature, the, the piece that requires legislation is we're going to figure out exactly what that legislation is going to look like. And that's why we put on the legislation, the piece that requires legislation, the ability of the union president, and the county executive to adjust that as needed uh, in case we go through these work groups, go through the actual evaluations. Uh, him and I have the ability to be able to adjust that before we send it over to the council. So it's in uh, the correct format that both him and I mutually agree to. Okay, Mr. Buttle, you, you earned your paycheck today. That was a really good um... That was a really good description and overview. I, I appreciate that. That that does help clarify exactly what um, we're, we're talking about. Um, on the merits, you know, as I've shared with you, I do look forward to the discussion of the legislation um, because, you know, as chair of the Health and Human Services Committee, particularly this last year, I'm very sensitive to unintentional, um, unintentionally creating disincentives to calling in sick. Um, particularly, you know, with what we've what we've experienced this last year, if people are sick. We want them to stay home, um, and so, uh, you know, particularly like we, you know. So I, I I look forward to the discussion and the more deliberate context as we talk about this on the merits. Very much appreciate and respect the willingness of IAFF to come up with creative solutions to solve these long-standing issues, and it's even beyond these last six years, as the council president noted. Uh, we're talking generations of, of uh, uh, previous administrations that have tried to address this issue uh, once and for all and have not been successful. So I appreciate um, wanting to work through this. Um, but, you know, at such time, I look forward to a, a broader discussion when we have more details. But um, I'm still not entirely clear what we're supposed to do today. Um, but I'll yield back to council staff and to you, Mr. Council President, um, to see if we can, you know, talk about clarifying language uh, so that we avoid some of the confusion that has, we've gone down this rabbit hole with. And, and the item that is in front of you today is the item described on the top of, of page five of the staff packet, and that's specifically the crediting of, of dollars into deferred compensation accounts for, for, for units under $176 uh, hours. That is would not require legislation that's funded. It's in the executive's budget. And that's the item that's that's before you today. I will note that we we had heard that there had been some discussion of this as a pro proposal to address overtime issues. We directly asked the executive if that was their justification, um, and we were not told that that was the justification for this. We were told that it was negotiated, and that's the justification for it. Um, and so we have not received any analysis or any data about how this provision would or would not affect overtime hours. Okay, um, public safety chairman Katz. Thank you very much. You know, I think we can go back to council member Friedson's uh, uh, initial discussion that we need clarification in this, what we're attempting to do. Because as confusing as it's gotten today, just imagine what it's gonna be like six months from the day, what was said and what wasn't said. So I do think we need some clarification on both parts, because there's two different parts here, on both parts. So I think the first clarification should be what Council Member Friedson is suggesting. And the second, and, and working with uh, IAFF and, and everyone else so that they're comfortable with the language as well. Nobody's trying to do anything is, that, that 
we're not really in agreement on. It's just how we're saying what we're in agreement on that we're going to eventually get this legislation. The second part of this, and, and Council President, you are very correct that this has been going on forever about the overtime. And as we have mentioned in public safety time and time again, the overtime, though, you know, people look at it as to, oh my gosh, look what you're spending. If you, if we didn't spend it this way, because for many of the staffing decisions, you have to have an EMT there. You have to have various, various uh, people on, on, on the staff who are, who are going to go out and save somebody's life. So that became part of what we do. And to, and, and I've spoken to Mr. Buttle as well. The, the idea that this is a good possibility that we could be saving on overtime uh, and and still be keeping people safe. And so uh, we would be saving saving money and saving lives needs to be that discussion. But we need to have it. We can't keep saying that next year we're going to get to it. That, that doesn't work anymore. So as far as I'm concerned, there are two parts to this. I think we need to be very clear. I think, candidly, both parts could be very helpful to uh, the county budget as well as to the as well as to the county uh, people who live in Montgomery County. But we need to make sure that that's what we have and we need to work through it. And it would be helpful to Mrs. Uh, Silverman's uh, point earlier on if I understand that it's going to take a while to get some numbers together. But, you know, as Mr. Buttle said earlier on, if, if you bring this in, if the agreement is that you have to have it by July 1 or whatever, and you bring it over June 30th, you've met the agreement, but that's not helping anybody. We need this as soon as is practical to, to get this uh, discussion going so that we can be prepared for this, for the, all the savings, both lives and, and, and money that we can come up with. So as far as I'm concerned, we should have clarifying language so that there is no confusion on what we are and aren't talking about. Thank you. So, Councilmember, do you prefer to pass the resolution today with the assumption we're going to have clarifying language be, uh, before us before reconciliation, or that, do you want for action today? That is where I, I think we could do that. I do. I mean, we could have in the in the uh, what we're passing and saying that before we pass it, we'll have the clarifying language. But but just to keep saying we're going to come back to this, right. I, I don't know what we're gaining. Essentially, a straw vote with the assumption we're going to have clarifying language before reconciliation. Correct. That's where I am. Can I, can I just, I, I'm sorry, my internet went out. I don't know exactly what's happening. Um, but the, the collective bargaining agreements, you need to make a decision by May 1st on whether you, you're going to approve or disapprove right. each provision. These are two provisions, two separate provisions in the IAFF contract. And you, you you know you can't just say well we'll get clarifying language later if you're not going to make a decision today which is fine you don't have to make final decisions today you need to vote to uh, extend the time to make final decisions on the collective bargaining agreements beyond May first because your next meeting is until May fourth you have to do it till at least May fourth uh, yeah that's a good point. Bob, I think we lost you again. Let me call on the GO chair, Councilmember Novato. Thank you. Um, so I guess where I am a little bit confused um, is the fact that, I mean, I really do wish that the administration would uh, explain a little bit further what they were basing, um, how this came about. I, I you know, I met with our union partners and I understand the effort because it has been a longstanding issue. This whole issue of overtime really has been one. Um, but obviously, you know, you have to admit that it's a bit concerning that Ms. Silverman is saying that they don't really believe that this necessarily has the kind of savings. And so, you know, I hope you guys understand also the position that we are uh, in terms of, uh, 
yes, of course, we want to figure out ways to address the issue of overtime if we're spending $20 million. That is significant. We might as well just hire a lot more firefighters for that. Absolutely. Um, but I, I am somewhat disappointed that, you know, there isn't, this is the time for the administration to be able to say, hey, we believe that, you know, the reason why we negotiated this is because we do believe that this will take us in a particular direction. Not to say, yeah, we went ahead and negotiated this, but now we're going to have a work group and then later on, maybe we'll see what happens. And so, you know, I, I am sensitive to the fact that our union partners came to the table in good faith to try to find some solutions. But I need to register my disappointment with the fact that I'm not hearing from the administration any particularly solid reasons why this was important, for example. I also want to register that some of these things are different fiscal policies, that we're making decisions to change particular fiscal policies that we have adopted. And I think it is very unusual, and I hope it doesn't become a practice for the council to have to be almost forced to make fiscal policy changes during the process of budget and contract uh, approvals. That is not a good thing to do. So I just want to register that in general. Um, if we, you know, if we can add some clarifying language, that is fine. But I just want to register that this is a problem going forward and it's not the conversation here and my comments and are directed at our employee unions is directed at the administration that if indeed there are going to be particular things negotiated that may require changes in fiscal policy and the council has that responsibility, then this needs to be discussed ahead of time in some ways. You know, at least be able to say and flag, hey, we believe that this is this is what we agreed upon actually uh, early on. Wanted to register that uh, because both, I think, you know, the issue of the cost sharing with the uh, group health insurance, as well as this particular piece, in my opinion, we might arrive at the same place, but the fact that we haven't had that conversation doesn't doesn't feel collaborative to me. Uh, and I don't know, I can't remember in the past when we did something like this in a similar fashion. So want to be on record saying that I hope that this doesn't happen again, um, because, you know, it, it might not end up where we believe uh, needs to end up. Thank you. I agreed. Um, Ms. Bryant, I just want to ask you, is that your view too, that um, that this change to the sick leave policy wouldn't result in any cost savings? And if that is the position, then why negotiate it at all? Um, thank you, um, Council President Hucker. I, I believe that it will result in some savings, but that has yet to be um, totally quantified, which is why Ms. Silver, Silverman mentioned that we will have this work group to kind of look across um, all of the assumptions that may fall in under um, this provision. There's a lot that would go into this, so we want to uh, make sure before the executive has an opportunity to send the legislation to take a deeper dive look at this and be able to meet with our union partners and to um, come up to an agreement on, you know, what the savings looks like and what would be the most appropriate uh, method and items to put forth in a um, in legislation later. I think that might be why part of the reason why this particular provision is um, subject to at least being provided to the council a, a year after um, the budget is actually passed. Okay. Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> if you don't know how much you're going to save, then you can't say it's a cost-saving measure, right? I mean, that's that's just. I mean, if you can't quantify what it is, then how can you say it's cost-saving? So you can assume or think that it may be, but you can't say it is. And I think that's what Ms. Silverman said. So I understand that, and I do also want to echo that I appreciate. Uh, our union partners continuing to try and find ways to be able to alleviate the overtime issues that we've had ever since I've been on the council, ever since everybody's been on this council, we've had these issues. So, I mean, and long before we were here. So I appreciate trying to continue to think of different kind of ways. So we'll have to see, but um, let's be very clear about it. It's not a cost-saving measure until you can have that data that shows that it is. 
So that being said, I'm just going to be very brief. I agree with everything that everybody said so far. I really appreciate, again, thinking about this and thinking through it. I think that the clarifying language to make sure that uh, it's understood about what our intent is and that uh, what Councilmember Friesen espoused at the very beginning is important. And so if we have to extend the date uh, to May 4th to add in that clarifying language and all agree on what that language exactly says, I'm perfectly fine with that and would support that. I know it's not a motion before us, but if it were, I would support that. So I'll signal that. I'll have some other things to say, but I want to stay on this point, um, Mr. Uh, President. So if I could be just put back in the queue, I don't want to muddy all this conversation with other issues that I have that I want to talk about as well. So I'll cede my time back. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Raymer. Thank you so much. Uh, could I just ask uh, maybe Mr. Buttle, was this request for the legislation, was this IAF's request to the executive branch or was it the executive branch's request to IAF? IAF, IAF? Uh, you're talking about the legislation that that we right. agreed to submit. Uh, it was a mutual agreement during the course of negotiations. Uh, we memorialized that via a side letter. And what the side letter requires is that on or before June 30th of 2022, the executive would submit the legislative request to the council. Okay. I guess every, the origin of anything is sealed up in the bargaining process, I suppose. But um, no, it was, a, I want to be clear. It was a, it was mutually agreed to. Right. No, I wouldn't. Was, Okay. It definitely understood it was mutually agreed to. Okay, I guess sorry. I was quite, I was interested to know who asked for it. Um, I'm not taking a position on it. I guess what I'm trying to get to is what I heard from OMB was something I thought was very interesting uh, and, and, and helpful is that there's going to be a working group to tackle this bigger question about overtime, which has been a challenging issue. And I have heard over the years that there are potential savings that need to be claimed in that system. And so I was sort of interpreting that looking down the road, you know, IAF might have said, well, we want this change in any future discussion, and we're going to ask you to put that legislation in at this time. But to me, the more important thing is what I heard OMB say was that the legislation is supposed to come in a way as a result or it's like an implementation of agreements that might come out of this work group. Um, can I, can we go back to the, our OMB staffer, Miss? I'm sorry, I, it's been 30 seconds, so I, it, it's been five seconds, so I've already forgotten the name. I'm, I'm so sorry. Silverman, um, so just, just, to, just to clarify, the, the, the work group is to take a look at um, changes to the pension for Group G and one of the, and the viability of making changes. And so one of the changes would be um, sick leave, increasing the sick leave credit from the two and a half to five percent. And part of the viability then would be the impact of any overtime savings that might be a result of that. And, you know, I just want to echo that, you know, the county executive in partnership with IAFF is very eager to take advantage of any overtime savings that can be identified. And so to the extent that this is successful in that and that, you know, that working group finds that there is savings, we all want to capture that. That is, does the, is the work group mandate to focus on this specific issue or of... Um, what is the mandate of this working group? Sorry. It, it, the mandate of the working group is to take a look at, at this as, as um, well as a number of um, pension provisions. I'm just trying to see if I can look at the language really quickly. Council Member Reber, my, my understanding is the work group is looking at pensions of which this is a subset. It's not a work group looking at overtime. I, okay, right. Less different. I was, I was, I was, I was, uh, I guess I was going to suggest that we ought to just be clear that consideration of the legislation might be contingent upon making some additional recommendations that it's part of that are aimed at, uh, you know, addressing these underlying issues. Um, but it sounds like this is a working group that's focused on pensions generally, um, but. Uh, Aaron, could, I'm sorry, Hans, could you restate the work group is focused on pensions, but Ms. Silverman brought it up in response to my question about overtime savings. Yes, it is focused on pensions. It's focused on the viability of altering pension um, 
pension benefits and pension um, attributes such as the sick leave crediting. And so, um, you know, one thing that we're interested in seeing is whether that change to the sick leave crediting, um, which impacts pension benefits, would have uh, increased viability as a result of the overtime savings that you had referenced um, previously, if that makes sense. So that's like a deliberation process that you you will proceed through to inform the legislation that you might send. Right. So the legislature, so the, so the uh, IFF president in concert with the county executive could could amend the content of the legislation that would be brought forward at the end of the year um, if there was a need or desire to do so as a result of really anything that comes up over the year, but also in particular the findings of the work group. Okay. The only thing it has to do with overtime savings is by extension assessing the impact of overtime savings on the viability of pensions, correct? Correct. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, like others, I'm a little bit unclear here. We could, we could reject this portion of the bargaining agreement, but this portion of the bargaining agreement has no likely fiscal impact. Right. Um, so I'm sort of unclear, you know, what, you know, the juice is worth the squeeze here. There, there are some other issues that we need to take up that have right. a bit more consequence. Um, right. We got a lot in front of us. I don't, I don't mean in life generally, though, I mean, in these bargaining agreements, but, uh, you know, so, um, I, I, Bob, back to your point, you want to make sure that we have, we are clear that nothing, that there's no funding that is being provided, uh, I, I suppose, is that what you're trying to establish? And that there's no approval of this provision. I mean, this is, you know, I've been you here for going on 14 you, years. Are you concerned that they could implement this provision without the legislation? Bob? I, I, sorry, I think this summer might be having um, more connection issues, but I think the staff's concern was just being very clear that there was no, because there was no actual legislation before the council, that there was no implicit, you know, agreement that they would, you know, approve something that we hadn't seen yet. So I think that was the idea of having something in the budget resolution just to be very clear and make sure everyone's on the same page that there is no appropriation for right. this and the council has not taken this issue up and will take it up when the legislation gets submitted to the council, you know, per the normal process, as, as Mr. Butler mentioned. Seems easy enough to add some language into the resolution right. without having to go through the effort of rejecting the provision. Yes. Uh, and, I, and I see the council president nodding, and it may be something that we all, you know, would agree upon. I thought that's why I suggested. Right. Just to clarify, yeah. that yeah. was the point I was trying to and that was Yes. A while ago in this conversation. So I just want to note. Correct. Agree to agree to agree to agree to agree. You get all the credit. Public safety chairman Katz. Thank you very much. I think the luckiest person here is Mr. Drummer because he hadn't had to hear this entire conversation. Um, the, the, um, Mr. Mr. Uh, President, I move that we approve this, uh, this, uh, this language that we approve this and that we come back with clarifying language where it's my understanding. We're just talking about, uh, a straw vote today anyhow. And I think. Rather than have a headline that says we rejected this this uh, this agreement, I believe we should approve it and then come back with a clarifying language. And the clarifying language, candidly, should not be that difficult to write. I mean, we're, everybody is saying the same thing about 15 different times. It's just that we keep saying it. So uh, that's my motion. Thank you. There a second. Nobody will second that. <laughs> second. Second. The GO chair seconds. All those in favor? Question? Councilmember Reamer. It's just really important to be clear about motions. I mean, to approve with, I think you have to clear the, I, can you just declare your intent again, please, Mr. Katz? So that. And I move that we approve this 
and that we come back with the clear with the straw vote for a straw vote and that we come back and I guess it's next week with the clarifying language. So it's a straw vote approval pending additional language. Yeah, the clarifying right. language. Yep. And just a, a further clarification, there are two thises on the table. One this is the pension uh, amendment that is subject to future legislation and does not have funding. There is about a quarter of a million dollars of funding in this year's budget recommended by the executive for that separate element of the IAFF contract that would provide for partial month credit of unused sick leave to be cashed out into deferred compensation. And what's your view on that? I mean, the council, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the council staff has not recommended anything different. They, they've not recommended that we reject that, if I'm understanding. This, that's not covered by Bob's comment to us, right? The, the, the credit we are not recommending rejecting. Right. So, that's sort so of you're not. saying it in positive. I, I'm interrupting too, but so you're, you're recommending that we approve that, correct? The, the, yeah. the partial yield credit. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we have raised our concerns about the cost of the overall package. We are not opining on any particular line item. My my motion is the overall package and that we come back. No, no, no. Your motion, your motion is not the overall package, I believe. You're motioning on this specific. On this, on, what, on this part of the discussion, the right. overall package of this part of the discussion. Well, if, if if you approve the the agreement to enhance their pensions, absent whatever clarifying language you're going to have, then when the pensions come over, when the legislation comes over, you're going to be required to, you know, put money in the budget and pay for it and approve. I mean, it's like, you know, in 14 years, I've never seen a provision come across from the from a collective bargaining agreement that is will send you the legislation sometime during the year uh it, it always the legislation always comes with the bargaining agreement here's what we want so that's the problem it's like you you just you can't even i mean you can just not approve it you don't have to reject it just say we're not approving it which I think everybody's agreed to. There's yes. no, there's nothing to approve. We we agree with that, Bob. We're not approving that, and we're making it a point that we would clarify that we're not approving that. Okay. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I, I my internet service in the area is is having problems. It's actually Xfinity, but I'm trying well, to do I, this. And I mentioned, and I mentioned, Bob, that you're the luckiest person here. Because you didn't have to listen to all this, but but uh, but that is exactly what I'm suggesting: is that we approve it without this and clarify that that's what we're doing. Right. Okay. You want to approve everything else except this? Yes. Okay. I misunderstood you. I'm sorry. Understanding. We're going to get I'm, I'm glad you're clarifying the clarification. Yeah. Um, Councilmember uh, Albernoz. No, I, I think we just clarified it now. I, I think that the internet connection issues have contributed to some of the confusion that we have here. Um, I know we're all trying to do the best on the fly. I, I do think there's some lessons to be learned from this entire discussion to Councilmember Navarro's point and her initial comments. We need to avoid having this happen again um, because this has not been particularly productive or helpful. So um, I, I agree with approving the rest without this uh, and then coming back to this at such time when there's actually something for us to be able to focus on and vote up or down. But the, there's also the group health insurance issue. Right. I, I don't know if you're approving that as well. No, I mean, the we, have up, any, we have not taken up anything else. All right. We're so just we're talking about. Everything. All right. Okay. You got it, Bob. Council member. Okay. Yeah. Well, originally I was just going to clarify making sure that council member Katz's point that the intention based on the discussion is that we are affirmatively not taking a position on a policy that has not yet come before us that has no funding appropriation in FY22 and that we have clarifying language that's not yet before us but that we're signaling our intention for the final resolution to include and there is a, an element 
uh, the second element as part of this discussion, which has confused and baffled uh, many of us, um, that does have a funding element and that would be approved because we have to appropriate the funds in the budget and have to provide uh, an indication uh, for it. And I just wanted to clarify, that is all that we've only been talking about IFF's contract up to this point. And we've only talked about these two fairly modest in the scheme of the broader contract provisions within it. And so I just wanted to make sure to clarify whether the motion was just to provide clarifying language for the one element as discussed and approve the other element or whether it was for the entire IAFF contract with those two items. I just thought it would be helpful to clarify for staff and for those watching at home and frankly, for those of us who are voting. Okay, there's a motion on the table. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That is Council Member Katz, Council Member Glass, Council Member Friedson, Council Member Rice, Council Member Juano, Council Member Reamer, Council Member Albernaz, Council Member Navarro. All those opposed? Nobody. Okay. Some of you a little slow on the draw. Okay, great. So the motion passes unanimously. Terrific. We look forward to the clarifying language and the future discussion. Mr. Trump, can we move on? We can, uh, the next, if, if you, Howard, sorry. yeah, no problem. If, um, if you want to move on to the next section of the recommendations for the straw votes here, um, we have the, on page 25 of the packet, we have the recommendations for group insurance, allocations for retirement and the county government compensation related NDAs. Staff recommends approval of all of those as submitted by the executive, except for the uh, cost share split for group insurance, which would be part of the next item that Mr. Drummer will walk through. Those could be done as a block if council members support that. It's okay with me. I see some nods. Okay. I see a, a lot of nods. Okay. So move. Is that what you're looking for? Uh, is Bob, were you, were, were, do you, did you need to jump in on this? As Craig suggested, if not, uh, well, if we're going to get to the collective bargaining agreements, it'll come up there. The 80, 20 cost share split. Um, but if you want to make a decision on that now, you that will come up as part of the collective bargaining agreement. So let's, Okay. What I think the, would be most efficient is to do the everything except for that right now, everything listed on page 25 of the packet, which is nothing in the collective bargaining agreements except for the cost share split, which will be discussed momentarily. Okay. So, Councilmember Rice, is that thumb indicate a motion? Sure, Mr. President. Here, a second. 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 Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Terrific, that is unanimous. Okay, Mr. Howard. Okay, now we are moving on to uh, Mr. Drummer's um, item number eight on the specific collective bargaining agreements themselves. Mr. Drummer, are you available? Uh, I, uh, I am at the moment, I'm on my cell service here. Um, you know, there's three agreements, McGeo, FOP and, and IAFF, and they are, um, they're all, I guess, uh, they were originally were multi-year agreements. And what you're looking at is what's in FY22, either something that requires an appropriation of funds or a change in law or regulation. Uh, the, each agreement has a general wage adjustment that, uh, has already been explained to you in uh, Mr. Howard and Mr. Trumka's packet. Uh, I think what they didn't mention maybe is the McGeo agreement has a 50 cents an hour increase on July 1, 2021 for seasonal employees, as well as the 1684 for everybody in June of 2022. Uh, the IAFF agreement as uh, was mentioned earlier has actually two parts. It's 1.5% in 
in the last pay period in June of 22, and then has a potential increase based on the CPI. And we go around in circles on this, but again, there's, there's, we would recommend, you know, funding the 1.5%. And even the agreement says that they would need a supplemental to fund any increase to the 1.5% due to uh, the CPI, um, that that's actually not something that you can approve now because you don't know what the CPI is and have to set the budget. Uh, so that would be just a 1.5% in June of 22. The service agreements have already been discussed. McGeo, they're three and a half percent for everybody on their anniversary. Uh, McGeo has a lump sum agreement for those employees that are not eligible for either a service increment because they're at the top of the grade or a longevity increase. Uh, and that's a lump sum that doesn't go into the base. I'm looking at a chart, by the way, that's on in the packet on pages D1 through D3. Uh, there is the additional service increment for McGeo, which was already mentioned earlier, 1.25% for those employees that were here in FY11 but did not receive, well, no one received a service increment in FY11. The packet explains who's gotten these and who hasn't over the years. Uh, just will note that non-represented employees have never gotten any back service agreements. FOP and uh, IAFF, I believe, have gotten two. McGeo is behind. This would put them still behind, but a little closer to the other two. Uh, the longevity increments are the same as usual. They were already discussed for all three. There's tuition assistance. The executive actually reduced the amount of tuition assistance for everyone by $150,000 this year. Uh, so nobody's getting an increase. Uh, it's actually a decrease, not for the FOP would be the same. And the IAFF and McGeo would be sharing $100,000 with non-represented employees. The group insurance benefits, this is, this is the one we're recommending that the count, the council should reject. Uh, since FY11, the council changed the cost share from the 80-20 in the collective bargaining agreements to 75 25, which is 75% county paying, 25% employee, except for HMOs. Uh, in each year since then, the agreements have never been changed to reflect reality, but the council has gone ahead and continued to approve the 75-25 cost share. This is the first year, uh, I think through Throughout the years, the executive has managed to send over funding only for 7525. He he got charged with a prohibited practice one year for doing that. And most years he's gotten some sort of agreement from the unions in this to send over the 7525. He did not get an agreement from the FOP or the IAFF. So he sent over the 8020 share. If, in fact, you go along with the council staff recommendation to continue the 7525 that we've all been living with since FY11, you would actually save $1.46 million. That's the difference in the cost share for FOP and IAFF. Uh, then McGeo has some increases in pay that are shown on D2. There's a shift differential increase. There is a increase in number of positions eligible for field training pay. These are actually small dollar, relatively small dollar, an adjustment for holiday pay, an increase for the fire marshals, uh, standby pay, and a $1,500 stipend for HHS crisis center employees. 
uh, that would be on top of their salary, $1,500 stipend. Uh, there's, there's an extra half hour pay for uh, 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 corrections, resident supervisors and corrections who are not permitted to leave the facility for lunch hour, for their lunch half hour. Uh, there's a change in the acting pay provision and it would be a flat for McGeo $5 an hour for uh, working above your grade. And there's the meal allowance goes from 10 to 15. There's no change in the FOP agreement. There are uh, several provisions in the IAFF agreement on travel expenses, expense reimbursements that the executive branch was unable to give us a fiscal impact because they didn't know they didn't have a fiscal impact for that. Uh, there's also some increases in clothing, equipment, vehicle use, and transit subsidy. Uh, there's highway services get an increase in their boot subsidy from 145 to 200. These are not large items. There's a uniform allowance increase for resident supervisors and other corrections employees. Uh, the transit subsidy which I believe would be shared with non-represented employees would go up from $75 a month to $265 a month. That's the subsidy if you give up your parking spot and you would get that to use for public transportation. Uh, there's a shoe allowance provision, which we're told is actually not a change, but is now in the agreement that was informal before for DGS and a provision in the FOP agreement for police officers to receive cell phones. It's in this agreement, but I'm told the executive branch pointed out that they've already provided the cell phones, so there's no cost for this year. And the, the IAFF has no changes in clothing, uniform, transit subsidy. Uh, then the, the other provisions are the ones we, we spent some time talking about. Well, first, Mageo is a new sick leave provision that Mr. Trumka explained. It's based, it's a flat rate based on uh, how many years you've been there and not based on your actual hourly rate of pay. Uh, if you have 120 hours of sick leave, when you leave, you'll get $5,000. If you have 240 hours of sick leave, you'll get $10,000. I will say on this provision, the it's for the people in Michio who are in the RSP and the GRIP, and the people who are in the ERS, the public safety employees, uh, already get up to two years. They can use up to two years of sick leave as service credit on their pensions. So sick leave is actually very valuable to uh, people in the ERS. Sick leave when you leave, if you're in the RSP in the grip right now is worth nothing. So this is an attempt to sort of even the scale a little bit. And it's a uh, it's a flat rate, 5,000 or 10,000. And I believe this would be pushed out to non-represented employees as well. There's no change in the retirement plan for the FOP. And we've spent a lot of time talking about the firefighters, uh, the IAFF, the two provisions. There are two separate provisions. One is the uh, pay for unused sick leave that they don't get to use for service credit because you get, uh, it has to be in denominations of 176 hours for a month of service credit. So the leftovers. And then the the change in the pension, which we just went over and over again. The unused sick leave is $239,146. Uh, as as uh, Mr. Buttle was trying to explain earlier in the beginning, uh, I believe it's it's an attempt to make sick leave more valuable so that people won't use their sick leave uh, while they're active employees and save it for when they retire. And therefore they'll need less overtime. 
it, it, it makes a pretty, uh, that in, in the pension provision is kind of similar. I'll just say this. It, it makes a, a pretty big assumption that people are, that members of the IAFF are actually using sick leave when they are not really sick. Because if they're really sick, you don't really want them to show up at work. Um, and that you somehow will save an overtime because they will stop using sick leave when they're not really sick. I, I don't really understand the logic of that, but that's what it's based on. Um, so as I said earlier, you need to either make decisions on the collective bargaining agreements, which is your, you know, the resolutions that are in the packet to uh, either approve or disapprove, you can, don't have to use the word reject, approve or not approve each provision in the collective bargaining agreement by May 1st, each provision that requires council approval, and that's only things with money or legislation. Uh, and yet, if you don't make decisions today, you need a, a vote, a uh, majority vote, to delay the time period past May 1st, which can be done just orally by motion uh, and could move it on to next week if you're not ready to make decisions today. I think what our recommendation is, is that you approve the agreements except for the change in uh, the cost share for health insurance and the provision uh, that would enhance the pension for the IAFF of, for sick leave that was discussed over and over again. That, that would be our recommendation. And it's up to you if you want to act today or, or postpone it. I think I got that out before my. Yeah, we have Xfinity, some customers. Um, colleagues? Council Member Reamer? All right. Um, well, I guess I want to move the staff recommendation minus the confusing element about the firefighters provision, which we talked at length about, and I'm not sure. Anyway, no comment there. Um, it was a very confusing conversation. We also went right to that conversation. I think we kind of jumped into the weeds. I think it's important for us to talk here a bit uh, about the forest. Um, we, there are a couple of major fiscal issues that we need to just talk through. Uh, I think they help guide our decision or they should, and they certainly inform the council staff's recommendation. Um, you know, the first is the overall policy about affordability. And this council adopted very recently, actually, a strengthened fiscal policy that we should only support compensation that is growing proportionally with our revenues. And recognize that that can be smoothed over you know, several years. It's not always going to be an exact correlation on an annual basis, but it's really important as a policy for us to support. And when we don't have that basic dynamic, then what ends up happening is we end up approving packages that are exceeding our revenue capability. And in order to maintain services and fund the compensation, we end up in situations of, of real difficulty and possibly tax increases. Um, and then everyone you know, gets in each other's throat and the, you know, the, the public penalizes the county government, uh, often with the collaboration of some of the, you know, at least one, several of the bargaining units. And we end up with provisions like the Ficker amendment or term limits or changing in the scope composition of the county council. And those, those, the consequences of those actions are far more difficult for all of us, I think, than the rather momentary uncomfort of trying to hold the line 
uh, you know, annually and make sure that we're compensation is growing at the same rate as our revenue. Um, so as part of that policy, we are supposed to, we did request an explanation from the executive branch about whether their proposal grew at the same pace as revenue and if not, why? And, you know, the basic response was, uh, well, the only reason why compensation, it didn't make any sense, right? The basic response sought to ignore the actual cost of compensation and, and, and sort of distract by talking about what year it was decided uh, rather than, you know, just what year it's in. And, um, you know, the reality is you just can't square this package with our revenues because our revenues took a significant dive. We are all grateful to the Biden administration for providing all the relief funds that are going to make this year a, you know, a reasonably good year. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think we have to acknowledge that the executive branch's response was insufficient. It just simply did not answer the question. It, uh, you know, it kind of dodged the issue. And I think it raises a serious question, which I really do think we ought to take up about requiring that contracts have to be funded for the full year. They can't, you know, having these backloaded uh, contracts that only take effect in the last year, week of the year, is uh, it's just not truth in budgeting. And I understand why it happens, and I don't blame anybody for proposing it while it's allowed. Um, but, you know, the school system doesn't do that. Um, you know, we, we shouldn't really do it. It's just a bad practice. And, you know, I think if we were to set a framework, then the bargaining units and the executive will operate within that framework. And we ought to come back to that and take that up and, and change that. But, you know, having said that, um, I, I think it's also worth noting the, the bizarre explanation of the COVID differential that we got from the executive branch recently. You know, the CAO, Rich Maddalena, was here, made a, a, a claim that the cost of the differential package was that the state was introducing differential pay and it was just the same. It was going to be just the same as what the county had done. Uh, you know, literally said those words. And I knew it was wrong when he said it. And we asked council staff to look at it. And council staff came back and said, we looked at it. And, you know, the state's framework cost about one third of what the county's cost. We know that park and planning's cost, you know, maybe one tenth or less. So we have to factor in the $88 million or so in COVID differential pay into this equation. And I, you know, it, it, it's real, it happened, uh, you know. <laughs> um, and I think to the extent that we're not able to find funding this year's budget, you know, for services we'd like to improve, that has a lot to do with it. Uh, and so I just think we need to acknowledge that. And I don't, I think it was a real low moment when the when the chief administrative officer made that misleading claim uh, about the cost of that package, and I, I really I'm sorry that that happened. Um, to the immediate question, you know, the council staff's recommendations to us, uh, you know, taking out the confusing issue about the firefighters provision, uh, I can only say that this has been sufficient for 10 years now. We have continued to hold true to a very difficult decision to, that we made. Uh, Councilmember Rice, Councilmember Noir will remember. You know, we were, we had to make a lot of very unhappy choices. And I don't think we want to start working our way back into the kinds of changes that we had to work out of with, with great difficulty uh, in the Great Recession. Uh, and we, here we are actually in a new recession and talking about institu instituting policies that were so difficult for us in the last one. So I would just urge us to not fund that specific piece. There's a lot of other elements of these contracts that I think constitute pretty significant wins for the bargaining units. And uh, I'm not recommending any change in those, but this one I think was a very specific policy enacted during the Great Recession that uh, I thought established a fair framework around cost share for employees, and I, I think we ought to stick to it. So that is my uh, motion for the council staff's recommendations. 
that that's a, your motion. You're moving the council staff recommendations. Correct. Okay. Is there a sign? Minus, minus the IAAF provision that we've already discussed. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. Councilmember Friedson seconds for discussion. Is there any discussion? Okay. Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. So, um, look, uh, I, I had this conversation before, so I'm not going to rehash it again uh, another time. When we last year came together as a unanimous council and said we were passing a same services budget, we did it under the auspices of the fact that we understood we still weren't out of the recession uh, with regards to COVID, and we're still not. I mean, the ARPA funds, uh, no one even knows how we'll be able to use them, let alone, um, you know, the majority of those funds are already spoken for with a lot of the decisions we've already made when it came to uh, differential pay and others. Uh, so, so much of that money is already spoken for that I don't know where the money's going to come from. And so, you know, I'm not arguing about whether or not our employees deserve raises or not and deserve to have makeup steps, all those kinds of things. I'm just talking about whether or not the money's there. And it's coupled with the same fact that we have uh, looming, uh, which I've continued to say over and over again, huge cost increases when it comes to education. Our education system as a whole is changing in the entire state of Maryland in terms of what it is that we're gonna do regarding staffing. You know, uh, We have all come together and said that we're now talking about what it means to provide wraparound services for our students, and we know how expensive that is, that's going to have huge cost implications as well. There's just so many things that are floating out there that I wish uh, that we had something that still held the line that was a little bit more um, uh, uh, nuanced in terms of understanding that we have all of these outlying expenses that are just still floating out there. I mean, and then we have the letter from you know, Chairman uh, Anderson uh, about MNC PPC and everybody's going to have me two clauses. I will tell you that when it comes to being the chair of education and culture, I know our Montgomery College Union employees are watching uh, and and seeing what it is that we're doing here and looking for commensurate treatment. And so, again, these are the kinds of things where I think that it's hard for us because oftentimes we oper operate in this vacuum of not considering these other implications that are out there, but we didn't do that last March. We knew that all these other factors were out there and wanted to make sure that we were really focusing on addressing the immediate needs of what we have before us right now. And that hasn't changed. Those things still are so important and they affect our county employees, just like the, the, the pay raises do. I mean, th there are still plenty of families out there who may have one employee who works for county government and one who still hasn't gone back to work or gone back to work full time. And they're still trying to put food on their tables. And many of the programs that we have out there are helping them. I know because I've heard from them. I've heard from county employees who, who are talking about how their families are still availing themselves of county services. Um, so, you know, this is one where I, I just wish there were a more balanced approach. I, it, it's, it's hard for me to go through and pick and say, okay, well, this and not that, and that and not this. Um, that's difficult. And that's the challenge that we always have uh, as a county council, not being a part of the negotiations uh, and really trying to come to something that I think would be a win-win for all around. Uh, understanding that we still want to do best by our employees and try and do increases as we can, um, but have those in a modicum so that we can try and, you know, prepare for some of those unmet needs that are out there. I mean, we still got to rebuild a lot of our commercial uh, and, and economic development uh, that's fallen by the wayside. We have, you know, strip malls that are vacant. And those, it's not just about the commercial real estate developers who own them, who pay, you know, taxes and all that. It's about the jobs that used to be there that aren't there anymore. That's what I think about. I think about those people who used to work and go there and it's not there. So that's where I am. Um, I don't have a motion. I don't have a particular. I understand where Council Member Reamer is coming from in terms of trying to 
to make this package a little bit more affordable to give us some more room uh, when it comes to addressing all of the other things, the myriad of other things that we're going to have to answer the call about. Um, you know, so I appreciate uh, Council Member Reamer and your thinking about ways in which in staff, really, uh, staff's proposal um, of what it is that we need to do. But just wanted to put that out there and really for my colleagues who are going to return, um, we've been, as you heard from Council Member Reamer, in some incredibly tough situations. Uh, and when you paint yourselves into a corner regarding budget, it is uh, really, really tough to get out of it. Um, and so I just caution folks to think about that as they're moving forward and think about what this means and what the future implications are for everything else that you want to fund, that you want to try and make sure is a priority of yours, because all of these kinds of commitments uh, compete with that directly. So thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you. You raise a good uh, question about MCPS, and of course, I think we're all consoled by the fact that they're receiving a large infusion of new cash, uh, federal and state, and uh, they already have a more generous health care program. Um, Ms. Uh, uh, Council Member, uh, Vice President Albernoz. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm going to make some general comments here. I'll try to be specific because uh, obviously we're running over and there's a lot to process and digest. Um, so, you know, having been on this body now through multiple contracts and the first two um, underscoring what uh, Council Member Rice just said, and, and, and especially those council members that were there through the recession, experiencing that, having the scars from that, as I've shared many times from the dais, I have those same scars, but from a different perspective, a different lens. Uh, and so I, like um, all of us, have been very concerned about fiscal responsibility and ensuring that we live uh, within our boundaries uh, and that we continue to carry out our services to our county residents at a very high level, uh, a level that's been established over generations uh, of incredible um, staff uh, within our county government who've led us through some very difficult times in the past. And so um, that will always be my guide uh, in terms of ensuring fiscal responsibility and that we don't write checks that we later, later can't cash. Uh, I, I'm very sensitive to that. Um, what is also true, obviously, is this, la this last year has been unprecedented. It's been overwhelming. And the images of, uh, I know all of us uh, have acknowledged in many ways uh, the incredible sacrifices of our employees over this last year. And so um, both things can be true, uh, wanting to acknowledge those sacrifices and the challenges, the unprecedented challenges, particularly this last year, with wanting to balance our fiscal situation. And the, 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 the nature of year-to-year -year contract negotiations uh, is, is obviously a challenging one and an awkward one um, because within the context of what our employees have experienced this last year and what they're hearing and feeling uh, from our county residents in terms of needs that are off the charts, uh, government has never been more important than right now uh, in my professional lifetime um, in, in supporting the needs of our residents. Um, and so uh, to, to Councilmember Rice's point, I think going through line item by line item isn't appropriate. Um, and, and I, you know, it's, it's just, and so I'm prepared to support this package as has been presented to us um, because we acknowledge that there will be another negotiation for another contract beyond this. And my sincere and um, complete hope uh, is that the elements that are being taken up in this contract can and will assuredly uh, be taken into account when negotiating the contract that comes after this. Because some of the annualized funding that we are putting forward, and if we do support the 80-20 versus the 75-25 split, have to be taken into account, and I'm sure will be taken into account, into those, those negotiations, because we do have to look at the fiscal outlook, but look at it in terms of not just year over year, um, but a longer view. Uh, and so I do think that so long as these contracts balance out over time, taking into account all of these other issues, then it's something that we can be comfortable with. But it's predicated on the executive negotiating on the front end and taking into account those issues that I just mentioned, and that we do have the resources this year, thanks in large part to uh, some, but not all of the federal funding that we've received 
um, to, to be able to uh, acknowledge the sacrifices that employees have made and also acknowledge sacrifices that they've previously made um, to be able to move us forward. I'll also note just two things before yielding back to you, uh, Mr. President. One, um, we do have a significant percentage of population of our, of our workforce um, that is set to retire, and, and that has been the case now for several years. And so we are in a position where we are going to have to compete uh, with the private sector, the federal government, neighboring county jurisdictions for the best and brightest, as we have before, and ensuring that compensation packages um, on their own and within, the, within that framework uh, do attract this next wave, this next generation of public servants, I think is something that we need to take into account as well. So I'm prepared to support this contract as has been negotiation, uh, negotiated with the removal of the IAFF provision, which we will come back to and have to have strong debate and discussion over, um, because I do think it acknowledges this moment that we're in. And I fully expect that this will be taken into account in the next contract that's negotiated. Uh, with that, I yield back to you. Uh, thank you, Council Member Nevada. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, not much to add. I think I made my remarks at the beginning of this conversation uh, in terms of where I believe we are every year. Obviously, there's just a lot of competing interests and a lot of competing policy goals. Um, I think for me, something that has been um, front and center is just witnessing the extraordinary ways in which our employees have had to step up uh, without much training. <laughs> some of them have pivoted into other uh, responsibilities very quickly. And, you know, our residents have been able to be served in so many ways um, appropriately throughout this historic emergency because of the willingness of our employees to do that. So, I think that, that is how I come to this. Um, I, I think that it is appropriate to support the negotiated agreements. Um, I, I am, you know, I supported this notion of coming back to the IAFF, IAFF issue. Um, as a matter of principle, though, I, I am not able to support the 80-20 piece. Um, I do believe that the county council at a particular time had to make a very important decision, and it was not an easy one in terms of the 75-25 uh, split. Um, and, you know, it seems in many ways strange to have some of our employees with 80-20, some 75-25. It also, in my opinion, um, I think it is important to set a precedent that whenever there are going to be particular uh, policy changes like these, that it should be something that the council should have a say. Uh, and so I don't, I really don't find that this is consistent in that way. So um, I'm trying to figure out what the motion is uh, that is right now um, on the table, but if it includes the issue of making sure that we maintain what we have done for, I don't know, I think it's 10 years or so, which is, what the council had decided in terms of the cost share for the group insurance benefit to keep it at 75-25. I'm good with that. I'm good with coming back to the IAFF issue um, and then approving all the other provisions. Is that what's on, is that what's on the floor? Um, my understanding is council member Rimmer, do you want to quote, you're raising your hand. Do you want to clarify your amendment? I, yeah, it's, it's, to approve the package, I think it's, but it's just this one speed piece, but as you just said, Mr. Navarro, about the cost share is to say, we're not approving that. Effectively, the next vote, I think would actually be to approve the whole package. I don't think we voted on the compensation. It's been a little confusing. I gotta say the way that the staff memos have had decisions in one and then decisions in the other, and they, they're actually overlapping. I'm sorry about all that, but my intent here is effectively that we would approve the whole package, but not approve that cost share change. And I'm separating out the IAFF because we already decided what we're gonna do on that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a few other council members that indicated you, your intention to speak. Do you wanna, are we, just to be clear, are you speaking to council member Reamer's motion or the whole package? Is there anybody that needs to come off the list? Cause we're entertaining discussion on council member Reamer's motion at this point, right? Okay, council member Glass. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, I appreciate the thoughtful conversation and clearly uh, this being my third budget, uh, these are always tenuous policy conversations and uh, we, we've seen them play out, but uh, you know, we always come back to them and the dynamics and the, 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 the budgets are different and the economic situation every year is a little bit different. And so we, we discuss them with the facts that are in front of us. And so, um, you know, while we're talking about that one, I, I guess we're talking about uh, council member Reamer's motion uh, to approve everything with uh, the 75, 25 split uh, with, with that piece. But I, I, I do have one specific question within this package, um, a detailed one that I would just like to highlight. I don't know, uh, if staff or even Mr. Wren uh, are here to answer it, but uh, I see that there's a $1,500 stipend for crisis center employees. And it was my understanding that during this pandemic, uh, when individuals needed crisis center beds, uh, most of the time that place was closed. And so I'm just curious if someone can elaborate on the stipend and, and what we're hoping to achieve through it moving forward into FY22. Uh, yes, I can answer the intent, <coughs> excuse me, the intent of the uh, stipend. Uh, the crisis center therapists that work in the crisis center are part of uh, a larger job classification, the, the therapist series. And within that job classification, they're the only ones that have uh, uniquely different working conditions. Let's start with the way, with the hours. They're the only ones that work 24 seven weekends, holidays, etc. And uh, they're on mandatory call if, if there's insufficient staff available to come in, handle emergencies, so forth and so on. But more importantly, or as important, they are exposed to a higher level of potential threat because of the nature of the work they do in the community responding to uh, families in crisis, which we all know are very volatile situations. And having handled uh, dozens and dozens of those type of situations as deputy sheriff, it was always in that situation where uh, there was risk posed to myself and my colleagues while conducting those particular trying to uh, handle those particular episodes. So um, we felt strongly, the union and the executive, that we had to uh, incentivize that particular unit a bit to assure that we have um, a pool to draw on when folks that are currently working there retire or go out on you know, extended leaves, et cetera, from the larger job classification because we were finding it more and more difficult to find people that were willing to take themselves out of a safer clinical setting, not have to work weekends and typically have a nine to five uh, schedule. With, um, with the ongoing discussion about reimagining policing that uh, our community is, is in the middle of, it's clear that there are certain police responsibilities that are going to be shifted to those units, the crisis center, crisis teams. And I can assure you that um, there's an awful lot of concern about their safety and exposure and what their safety nets are going to be. So the anxiety or, or the, the trepidation, if you will, of moving into that particular unit is increasing throughout the job class. So we see this as a uh, recruitment into that unit, but also a retention initiative. Well, well, thank you for that explanation. Uh, clearly, my guiding principle over the last year uh, has been to make sure that our social safety net is strong. And, and you know, sometimes that, that means having goods like food, clothing, and, and medicine, and other times it's services like mental health care. And as you noted, uh, this council has spent a lot of time uh, talking about mental health care support. Uh, we're going to continue doing that. And if, if this is tied, as you stated, into those efforts that, that we know that we need, uh, that that uh, that makes sense to me. I just wanted to, to hear the the explanation. So so I, I thank you for sharing that. And uh, as I stated at the beginning of my comments, uh, I, I support the proposal that's, that's on the floor. Thank you, Mr. President.
Thank you, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I, I am supportive of the uh, negotiated agreements. I am confused, however, about the whole 75, 25, 80, 20 split. It, so, and, and I don't know who answers this, but the 80, 20, it's my understanding, is uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. And the uh, Kaiser and United are 80, 20 now. And that would con continue. Um, so the difference would be that the 80-20 would also be for Blue Cross Blue Shield rather than 75-25 for Blue Cross Blue Shield. Is that correct? Is that wrong? Can somebody clarify? Mr. Katz, the, the way it's set up now is that the 80-20 is for all HMO plans, regardless of the carrier. Um, so for Kaiser or any other HMO plans, and all other plan, all other non-HMO plans are at 75-25. That's the current policy that the council approved in FY11. What this provision would do would be to move all plans to 80-20, regardless of whether it's an HMO or a non-HMO. And I'm assuming the reason for the difference was because of the difference of expense that that uh, it cost the county for somebody to be uh, be under uh, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield? Is that is that the reason that we did it that way? Correct. Back when that decision was made, the there was a, a group insurance task force that did a lot of work on these issues, and the HMO plans were, you know, relatively, compared to the point of service plans, were relatively cheaper, um, uh, re relatively cheaper option for both the employee and the employer. And so part of the, that rationale was to help incentivize people to enroll in HMO plans. I see. And so I understand, Council Member Reamer, your motion is supportive of the, of the agreements with the one change of the, of the confusion between the 80-20s and the 75-25s. Am I correct in that? May I, Mr. Council President? Yeah. Um, okay. We, we left the last discussion about council staff's recommendations, and I was making the motion for council staff's recommendations, which include some broader fiscal issues and suggest that we not specifically approve this cost share change and then council staff also recommended some IAF change, you know, that whole discussion, which I believe we agreed with council staff essentially on. So I am moving the council staff's recommendations and we are, so that, that was my motion. And yes, to your point, effectively, that would approve the, the bargained agreements with the exception of this one provision, which is this particular cost share, which was a change we made during the Great Recession. Every year we have voted to retain that change. This is the first time we've received a negotiated agreement that changed it. Can, can I, thank you. Go ahead. Can I ask one other, to council staff, is your uh, your suggestions, are they the, the negotiated agreement with the difference, the only difference being the 80-20? Yes. And, and the and and what we've already you've already discussed the right, right, pension right. enhancement right. for the firefighters. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Friedson. Thank you. So I think this has been an unnecessarily confusing and convoluted conversation. So I, I would suggest. The motion that I seconded, that I thought I seconded, was specifically on one item. There were two staff recommendations that somehow we disposed of one prior in the conversation about the IAFF issue. That issue has been put to bed. We're no longer discussing that. I'm not sure why it's still being discussed here. There is a second recommendation that is related to cost sharing and the split of health care costs. And a question of whether or not we will maintain the 10 year precedent, decade long precedent that the council has taken, <coughs> which has been both to do a 75 25 split for all non HMO policies of the bargaining units and 80 20 in the HMO plan. That is the only issue 
that we are discussing right now. That is the amendment that is on the floor that I believe I seconded. And hopefully we can ultimately have an up or down vote on that one item. Is that correct? Are you seeking to not take up the fiscal reviews also that staff had embedded in their block? We were taking up the block minus the IAFF. I'm fine doing that. I just think that it has unnecessarily confused. That was my intent was to move the staff's recommendations minus the IAFF, you know, bottom line. So it's all written on paper. So it's really clear. That was my intent. Okay. I'm, I, I will accept a friendly okay. amendment to, to the motion. I just, a, a couple items. I associate myself with the comments made by Councilmember Navarro uh, on uh, these issues. I had originally seconded for the purpose of discussion. Uh, a couple key points here. One, I do think that uh, this is a precedent that has been set for 10 years and, uh, you know, it seems appropriate to be consistent on that. Uh, number two, um, I do think having in all possibilities where we can uh, some level of equity where appropriate uh, across uh, bargaining units uh, uh, seems reasonable to me. Of course, these are different uh, you know, units and they have different provisions, but where applicable, I uh, trying to do that. And number three, uh, it has been the precedent that the council, from my understanding, has proactively urged the school system to adopt a lower cost share, which has a fiscal impact of $25 million, according to uh, the fact. I understand that's not where it is, but it has been the longstanding policy of this council, the prior council and this current council, uh, to urge that. I find it to be inappropriate uh, of us to urge MCPS to adopt a uh, cost-sharing split that is different from what we are approving uh, here. I think we have to lead with our actions. Uh, so I think that if we are going to continue that, which it seems like we are, uh, and urge the school system uh, to make that change, uh, which has been the longstanding policy, that we should be consistent uh, with that. So. I just wanted to note those few items. Uh, I hope and would like to put myself back in the queue for broader comments about the uh, the, the, the uh, broader agreements, it, you know, assuming that we're going to have an up or down vote in the end. But if we're just talking about this particular item, that's, uh, you know, I, I will support the, the motion that I seconded for the purposes of the discussion in keeping with our uh, policy as it has been for uh, a decade. Mr. P Mr. President, could you just clarify that we'll come back to some people have made can, broad yeah. co comments about this. Some have, and I'm just trying to understand how that process is going to work. Because if not, I'll make broad comments now. We'll, we'll come back to the overarching issue. That's fine. Is, are there any other comments on this motion? Okay, great. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And I'm, I, I am in favor as well. Okay. That is, uh, that is unanimous among all present. I think everybody's present. Okay. Council member Al Albernaz, were you speaking? Okay. Uh, on the overarching question, council member Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this has been a challenging conversation. I will say it has been uh, a tough uh, dynamic. Uh, I associate uh, myself with earlier comments made about uh, provisions within the collective bargaining agreement that have not been uh, shared with us by the executive branch. And so I just wanted to, to note uh, those comments. I was speaking specifically to some of the individual provisions, but I did just want to uh, note that uh, the county executive negotiates on behalf of the county uh, and on behalf of county taxpayers. And it really uh, would be helpful uh, and more productive if the county executive then uh, worked with the council to explain what the provisions uh, are and, and make the case for why it's in the best interest of the county and the taxpayers uh, we uh, jointly serve. I think this has been challenging to move through it in the absence uh, of that. Uh, with that overarching uh, uh, thought, I, I just wanted to point out a few things. Uh, I am going to be supporting uh, the compensation agreements before us uh, as amended. Uh, I, I do think it's important to note uh, that I have uh, continue concerns about the pressure that this budget uh, and uh, this uh, these agreements as part of it uh, are going to put on uh, our operating budgets moving forward and on the fiscal sustainability uh, of uh, the county. Um, 
it's not just about the cost in fiscal year 22, it's about the ongoing uh, commitments uh, that we're going to make and that we have committed to. Uh, Council Vice President Albert has noted earlier the risk of issuing checks that we can't cash. And I, I just wanted to note that I'm concerned not just about whether we can fulfill the commitments that we're making, but what other sacrifices we're going to have to make in order to cash the checks uh, that we've done, what impacts that's gonna have on our commitments to education, uh, to transportation, to vital public services. And uh, I just uh, you know, hope that we keep that in mind uh, and uh, remember that uh, you know, there is a suggestion about affordability and affordability is not just about this current fiscal year that we've been infused with several hundred million dollars in federal funding uh, but it's about future fiscal years and the long-term sustainability of uh, the budget. Um, budgets really are a series of choices uh, and uh, certainly our county employees have uh, taken on tremendous sacrifice over the past year, uh, but we uh, ultimately have uh, a number of uh, challenging dynamics and are going to be faced with very difficult choices uh, as we move forward. And we're gonna have to decide uh, what programming and services uh, we can and can't pay for, and uh, we simply can't fund it all. Uh, so I uh, will be making this decision to fund these contracts in a very sober way, recognizing that uh, the council's actions on uh, these contracts uh, will limit some other areas of what we're able to afford and our ability to fulfill the commitments that we've made in our own fiscal plan. And I just hope that all of us uh, understand the, the full weight and consequences of what we're trying to do and are able to work with the county executive and the executive branch to uh, to make sure that we get the county budget on a sustainable path moving forward when the federal funding is gone and we have to pay for these obligations out of the revenues that our uh, residents and businesses uh, have to be in a position to generate. So uh, with that, I'll yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, I'll just add, um, this, is, this has been an incredibly trying year for all of us, and um, probably no one more than our essential workers that have been on the front lines all year. A number of them have um, lost their lives. Many more were hospitalized. Many have been running COVID patients to the hospital um, uh, every week, and, um, and they're still on the front lines providing the vaccinations and the food distribution and the transportation that our residents rely on. So, if any of them are watching, I want the count, them to know that the council, um, you know, is very grateful for their work and supports all this, you know, uh, is, is aware of all the sacrifices they made this year. Um, I personally support the contracts as they've been negotiated. I think it's frankly, I agree with council member Fritz and I think it's um, surreal and, and disrespectful that the county executive and the CAO aren't here to defend and explain their own contracts that they negotiated. Uh, I think we said at the beginning, this is $3.6 billion. It's a 1.7% increase, which is understandable. There's a lot of detail that went into it and they spent a lot of time negotiating these. I can't imagine what's more important that they're doing than being here. This is a little like running the ball to the one yard line and then leaving the field. Um, but it, it seems to me like it shows a striking lack of support for the contracts that they themselves negotiated and respect for this council. So um, anyway, I've said my piece. Um, can we get a motion to approve the resolution? Council member Katz. Second. Council member Navarro seconds. All those in favor? The amended resolution. The amended resolution. Great. Great. Thank you, council member. Yeah. Those in favor, raise your hand. Great. That, that is unanimous. I just, just to be clear, just procedurally, there are three resolutions, one, one for each bargaining unit. And and I know what you said, and I can write them up, but I just want to make it clear that you, you're you approving the three resolutions uh, with all of the provisions in there, except for the health insurance cost share split, and you're not approving the pension, the firefighter's pension. But, I mean, I just want to make it clear, there are three resolutions and we can consider them on right as you discussed yes that's fine i mean i think we've got decisions on 
Is everybody okay. just a straw vote? I was going to say, if, if you would like, I could well, make that motion and to make certain that we're clear. Council well, yes. Th this is not a, is this a straw vote and you're going to come back to this next week? Sure. Or is this a, Pardon, um, we need to indicate our indication. Right. It, it's it's an, a vote on the resolutions and the in parties on any provision we reject, the council rejects, they can come back before right. May 10th with changes, but. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, Mr. President. Council Member Juwanda. Yeah. Just, just wanted to uh, make a very brief comment. I know we, we voted on our, took the straw vote. We'll make it final next week. Uh, also just want to add my self to the course of appreciating all the hard work of our employees. Um, I'm glad that we took this vote unanimously. I think it's important to send a strong message uh, that uh, we understand how difficult this year has been. And we're all very happy that the fiscal situation isn't what it could have been. And we're thankful for President Biden and Vice President Harris and our federal delegation. And of course, important decisions ahead, uh, but this is important uh, right now. And so uh, sacrifices have been made. Uh, there were great points made by many of my colleagues and uh, just want to associate myself with the comments and the thanks uh, to our employees who have done uh, more than they thought they signed up for uh, at a time when we needed them greatly. So uh, thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Mr. President, I just want to clarify that the votes on the contracts are not straw votes. Those are final right. votes. We need That's to right. give our attention to fund them. Yes. Thank you. By the deadline. Okay, with that understanding, as Bob described uh, the motion, can we everybody raise their hand on Blanc, on Blanc for all three? Great, with those two exceptions, as amended. Great, thank you. Can we move on, Mr. Howard? Thank you. Yes, Thanks. we are done with compensation. That was easy. <laughs> it's a good thing we didn't do the Ashton sector plan today. You would have had built it out by the time we finished. <laughs> Are we next, Mr. President, in terms of going to CIP? I'm sorry. Uh, yes, now we have a work session on the amendments to the FY21 to 26 CIP, beginning with the public schools. Uh, let me turn it to ENC Chair Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I really want to thank uh, our uh, leadership and the Board of Education, namely President Brenda Wolf, who's with us today. We have Dr. Smith, our Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Uh, McKnight, our Deputy Superintendent, uh, Ms. Essie McGuire, our Associate Superintendent of Operations, Ms. Kara Mijas, our uh, Director of Division of Capital Planning, Seth Adams, Director of the Department of Facilities Management, Mary Beck from uh, our CIP manager of our Office of Management and Budget, and Veronica Joa, who is with our uh, OMB as our fiscal and policy analyst. Um, we had a number of issues that were before uh, the committee, and I will turn it over to Mr. Levchenko and really want to thank him, uh, as well as Ms. Rodriguez Hernandez, for their continued great work uh, in putting this packet together. I want to thank my colleagues on uh, the Education and Culture Committee uh, for all of their great work as well. And I want to thank you, Mr. President. You actually came in uh, and set in on that meeting uh, to discuss some of the issues that we'll be addressing as well. Um, one of the big takeaways is that still with the Build to Learn Act, uh, many people think that um, that has solved our construction problems in the state of Maryland and here in Montgomery County. And that couldn't be more uh farther from the truth. It certainly has helped us in terms of addressing a lot of the construction capacity needs uh, that we have. But the reality is, is that still some of this in terms of playing out remains uncertain. We're not sure about uh, what some of the reimbursements may exactly be and how much the uh, local jurisdictions like Montgomery County will have to still continue to put up for these projects. Uh, so we should be able to get a little bit more of that as we understand more about the legislation that was just signed into law. Uh, um, uh, and then uh, there were a couple amendments that were uh, proposed, uh, one of which uh, added $6 million for planning and design for Eastern Middle School. Uh, we didn't recommend funding the amendment at this time, but noted that 
if during the reconciliation process. Uh, certainly, if those kinds of dollars were found, we could consider that as well as the acceleration of other projects according to the Board of Education's list because we want to be respectful of what the Board of Education's process is and what they've been able to delineate in terms of uh, priority of the projects moving forward. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Keith to walk us through the committee recommendations. Um, but again, think that uh, this is right now where we are. It was very clear from uh, President Wolf as well as from Dr. Smith that uh, while these uh, proposed amendments were uh, given because the county council asked for them, uh, they do not support any of them, and I don't want to put words in the mouth. I'll certainly turn it over to President Wolf uh, to certainly speak to that end, but certainly did want to make sure that that point was heard loud and clear, uh, that the school system stands behind the recommendations that they put forth in terms of uh, what they'd like to see move forward with these priority projects that address the needs of the children in our school system. And so with that, I'll turn it over to President Wolf. Uh, thank you, Council Member Rice, uh, and thank you for noting that we made adjustments based on the fiscal circumstances this year, but these are not the board's recommendations, and I'm here to support the package that the board originally sent over, so we're asking you to identify the funds to fully fund what we sent. Uh, we know that the climate has not been good. So we went back and we, we reallocated and we readjusted um, things on our CIP and we are requesting uh, 3.6 million, 3.67 million dollars this year. Um, we know this is an amendment year and uh, we are hopeful that uh, we can work something out because the, we're disappointed by the recommendation of the county executive. He recommended $50 million less on our uh, approved CIP. And therefore, that would be $53.8 million less than our request for the amended CIP. Uh, we're here to work with you, and uh, we stand ready to, to talk about this, and we're glad to be invited today to continue these discussions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, President Wolf. I really appreciate that and wanted to make sure you had an opportunity because it was very clear in committee. And I wanted to make sure that that was clear for the council session as well as to the board's position. Dr. Smith, did you have anything to add, sir? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Rice. And good afternoon to all of the council members, President Hector and everyone. Uh, as Ms. Wolf said, it's a $53.8 million reduction and when that recommendation came forward, uh, that doesn't change the board's submission on December 1st. Uh, the Education and Culture Committee did ask us to look at non-recommended re uh, reductions. And so MCPS sent non-recommended reductions to the Education and Culture Committee uh, back about two months ago. And they would include a one-year delay to the Northwood High School Addition Facility Upgrade and the reopening of the Charles Woodward High School. Uh, there would also be reduced expenditures in out, in out years only for core systemic projects, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, planned life cycle asset replacement, and roof replacement. We took this approach in order to preserve the core of the approved capital improvement program that is already fully underway. The planning is underway, the planning is complete, and the projects are getting ready to start. And so this impacts the fewest number of projects across the entire county, and it prioritizes the systemic infrastructure spending. Because Woodward and Northwood High School projects are about to enter the construction phase, we need to be clear, and on behalf of the Board of Education and the school system, I want to make sure everyone understands, even if the council came back in a few months after this budget process and said, well, we want to speed these back up, it would not be possible because you can't buy time. The time would have passed and they're ready to enter construction. And so the Woodward and Northwood projects would be delayed if this is the final decision. And we think of all the bad outcomes, that's the best one that we uh, look, found in our analysis. Um, as we continue the 
the work in 2021, the school system will work to maximize additional state and federal dollars uh, in alignment with programmatic priorities and facility needs. Uh, but we should not rely on these funds in advance uh, of their arrival. We have many questions about timing, eligibility, uh, both at the state and federal level. Many questions have been asked and have gone unanswered at this point, and we look forward to continued work with the council and the county executive's office. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so let me go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Lepchenko and Ms. Uh, Rodriguez Hernandez to walk us through the decision points from the uh, Education and Culture Committee. Sure. And uh, just to summarize, we had the cover sheet of the of the council's packet today provides a very very quick uh, overview of the committee recommendations, and then the committee the packet for the committee is attached to that, and that has a lot more detail in it. I'm going to try to touch on the the highlights, uh, and then obviously if. If folks have questions, uh, we can then dig in. But in the interest of time, I'll try to I'll try to move fairly quickly. Um, as you heard, the board's request is about 1.7 billion dollars. Uh, although, as you also heard, their amendments are relatively or quite small in terms of the six-year change. Um, Ms. Wolf mentioned the 3.7 million dollars, which is only about a 0.2 percent increase in the six years. Uh, there is some, the dollars are a little weighted towards the fir first couple of years, about $20 million in the first three years. Uh, so that does create uh, some reconciliation issues. And that's what you heard uh, in terms of the executive's transmittal. Um, in addition to a lot of technical adjustments, uh, which uh, included a lot of acceleration of work uh, that the schools were able to do over the past uh, couple of years, uh, the executive was still um, uh, about $53 million lower overall in his recommended amended CIP compared to uh, the um, uh, board's request. And so that, that sort of becomes the starting gap, if you will. And that led to the uh, uh, committee's discussion of non-recommended reductions and asking NCPS to come back with those, and we'll get to those in a minute. Uh, but. So the, the $53 million number over the six years is, is sort of the first key number to think about uh, in this regard. Um, the state aid that was talked about earlier, while we do have obviously a completed legislative session this year at the state, and we have the base state funding established for FY22 for uh, MCPS and all the other um, uh, LEAs throughout the state, uh, we don't yet have a, a, a firm award for the built to learn dollars, which uh, there was an initial uh, allocation of bonds assumed in FY22. And uh, given that the uh, that MCPS is um, was allocated 21% of the total amount of uh, built to learn dollars uh, over time, which is um, uh, about 2.2 billion over over a decade. Uh, there certainly can be an assumption that, that we should be getting a share of that in FY22. There's about $520 million in bonds. Uh, so the question is, what do we assume going forward for that? And those discussions are still ongoing between uh, council staff, OMB staff, and um, MCPS staff. And as part of reconciliation, we will uh, bring forth to the council some options for what to assume for the built to learn dollars in FY22. Um, right now, without the built to learn dollars, we have, a, we have a state aid gap. But with the built to learn dollars, it's potentially we might um, be higher than uh, our FY22 numbers. But then we also have the out years to worry about as well. Uh, the state aid that was approved last, or the state aid that's assumed in the approved budget from last year does assume a ramping up of the built to learn dollars. And so the out years already do assume uh, significant funding from Built to Learn. Uh, and uh, as Mr. Rice uh, talked about earlier, we have some significant eligibility concerns, especially after the first couple years of the CIP where we get through our initial backlog. Uh, so that's work that needs to continue uh, and needs to be a high priority of the council uh, and the executive as part of its uh, legislative uh, um, goals for next year is potential changes to eligibility requirements to allow us to get a higher portion of state aid for projects. 
Uh, so that uh, we will have to make some initial assumptions this year, but then we have some work to do uh, going forward. Um, uh, I mentioned the executive's recommendations, which fall under these technical adjustments I mentioned. The 53.8 million, once again, is the number to really uh, focus on. Um, the, uh, the board's amendments are listed on the cover page of the uh, memo. Um, I, I won't go through them in detail, but just to note, the committee was supportive of the amendments, uh, obviously subject to affordability. That's really the key issue. Uh, but uh, when we went through the amendments, uh, some of them actually um, provide some, uh, some cost savings or some adjustment in costs in, in the years. For instance, the Bethesda Elementary School and Westbrook Elementary School amendments, uh, that project actually would, it, it provides a different solution for solving the uh, capacity needs at Bethesda Elementary School. It provides a less expensive solution and potentially a faster solution. Uh, so that's one example. Um, and there's uh, also some other uh, amendments, Crest Haven, Roscoe Nix, and, and the jo Joanne Leleck Elementary Schools, uh, where it's looking at, once again, a different solution uh, to solving the overutilization at uh, uh, Joanne Leleck at Broad Acres. Um, uh, then you also have uh, some amendments that actually defer uh, some expenditures. Uh, the Silver Spring International Middle School Edition, uh, where the, uh, the scope is actually reduced uh, and the completion date deferred because further study is needed, further work with the community to define that project. Uh, so uh, once again, this, this gets back to what Ms. Wolf was saying, which was uh, this was a, a, a pretty restrained uh, package of amendments. Uh, several, as I mentioned, provided um, either uh, cost reductions or uh, did not increase costs during the six year period. We did have some projects, uh, more traditional, where they are seeking construction dollars for projects, such as Highland View Elementary School Edition. Uh, so that will be an additional $16 million uh, in the CIP. Uh, and also an accelerated uh, completion date for Page Elementary School. Uh, that's one of the amendments as well. No change in the total project cost. Uh, so those are those are the, the, uh, uh, the individual school amendments. And then, um, uh, Superintendent Smith mentioned also some, some uh, requested increases in some of their systemic projects, which we can talk about. Uh, you may recall that last year uh, they had requested some increases and the council was not able to support those um, because of uh, fiscal issues, especially in the early years. Uh, and so they have requested uh, some of that to be um, increased back this year. And once again, we'll be uh, looking at that again. Um, this time around, of course, I think the systemic projects uh, do need to be given uh, some significant weight um, because of the, obviously because of the, the backlog that they've had, which they've had for a number of years, uh, but also getting back to the state aid issue, the systemic projects do typically get uh, a higher uh, amount of state aid per project than our individual school projects. So we, we wanna be careful not to uh, solve one problem and create another. Um, so. We can talk more about that uh, if you need to. But uh, next I wanted to talk about the non-recommended reductions. Superintendent Smith mentioned the two key reductions, uh, especially early on, are the Woodward High School and Northwood High School projects, which would both be, their completions would be pushed back a year. Uh, so th those, are, those are obviously big projects. They have a lot of dollars in, in the early years of the CIP. Uh, and. Uh, so that was where they were able to find savings in the early part of the CIP. And then they have reductions in several systemic projects later in the CIP in order to bring the six-year total down uh, closer to what the executive had recommended. Uh, so that, that was what they were able to identify. And we took those, uh, staff took those non-recommended reductions to the um, Education and Culture Committee. Uh, and we also looked at other potential uh, reductions or deferrals one could make, but uh, there, it's hard to get away from the Woodward and Northwood projects in the early years in terms of where you would find dollars there. And once again, we're trying not to go back to the systemics. Uh, they're already, they were already reduced in, in funding last year. Uh, so we don't necessarily wanna go back there again, at least not initially. Uh, so uh, staff did not identify uh, other projects in the approved CIP that we would go to first before these. Uh, so staff was, was uh, 
brought that to the committee and the committee also concurred that uh, pending, pending uh, affordability, that the non-recommended reductions would be where we go first. Uh, the question then becomes if we have to go further than that, uh, then we'd probably have to be looking at the amendments to the, uh, that the board requested that did increase spending. I mentioned earlier a couple of uh, the acceleration in one of the projects and the adding construction in another. Uh, those are the kinds of things we'd have to look at again, because once again, we do try to protect as best we can uh, the approved CIP. Uh, and to the degree there are, there are, addition, there are new projects or, or accelerated projects or things like that, however well justified they may be, uh, we have to try to protect the approved CIP as much as we can first. Uh, unless we see some obvious changes that can be made. Uh, so the committee supported that. Uh, it, did not, it did not take those non-recommended reductions up front. It still wants to see what happens with state aid and overall reconciliation in the CIP. But I think it is important to signal uh, that these non-recommended reductions would be where we would, we would look first uh, in terms of balancing the CIP. Uh, and uh, um, if you need to get any more detail about any of these particular projects, we're no. staff's happy to do that. Yeah, uh, no, we're good. Uh, we're good. Sorry, we have a full committee session on this. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. So, so I just I want to make sure that the council members at least have a flavor for what the committee had to go through, and that we still have a bit of a bit more uncertainty than we have in past years because of the state aid. I'm getting a lot of texts saying they're satiated. More than <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. President, just to turn over to you. There are still a lot of moving pieces, obviously, that are with all of our CIP. So we'll be coming back and taking a look at this in concert with what it is that we can look to do on the reconciliation list, understanding what's happening with the state and the Built to Learn Act, uh, what's happening with some of the other moving parts. I know the county executive has proposals for things that he wants to do with uh, some of the budget as well, some of which has already been kind of laid out in memos, um, but uh, certainly wanted to just turn it over to you and let you know that there's still some more work to do as a full council. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, okay, I think we're, I think we're good on this. Uh, is there a recommendation? There's a recommendation from the committee, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, so the recommendation right now is to continue to look. <laughs> there is no final because we don't have finality of what's happening with our Built to Learn Act money. And so it will be something where we're really addressing all of these non-recommended reductions with the concert of the Built to Learn Act analysis and what happens with reconciliation. So we're really kind of punting at this point, unfortunately, based on information that we still need to garner regarding CIP. Okay, well, I think without objection, we're probably good on this item. Mr. Superintendent, Madam President, we're really glad to have you and your team with us. Um, and we look forward to our continued partnership moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we can take up the FiberNet CIP. Let me call on the GO Chair, Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to thank Dr. Terekas for um, staffing this item for us. Also, I want to thank Ms. Gail Roper, Chief Information Officer, Department of Technology Services, Joe Webster, Chief Broadband Officer from DTS, and Felicia Hyatt from OMB. Um, quick summary, FiberNet uh, CIP provides for the planning, design, and installation of a countywide electro-optical fiber communications network with the capacity to support voice, public safety, traffic management, data internet access, wireless networking, including public Wi-Fi, and video transmissions among Montgomery County Government, Montgomery County Public Schools, Montgomery College, uh, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, Housing Opportunities Commission, the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission facilities. Also, video transmission includes distribution of public education, government access channel, and selected cable programming. Fibernet is the communications backbone for the public safety radio and technology services public safety mobile data systems and uh, also uh, DOT's advanced traffic management system and other technology implementations. By the end of FY22, and including sites connected by private carriers and institutional partners, FiberNet is expected to have a total of more than 1,845 sites on the network serving a tremendous variety of facilities from pedestrian beacons to public schools to fire stations to wine and liquor stores to major campus networks and large multi-story office buildings. 
And so the primary focus of the FY21 and 22 CIP will be to upgrade edge and core equipment, to expand capacity within FiberNet and to edge locations, upgrade hub sites, HVAC and back up power supplies, to leverage interjurisdictional connections and Ashburn data center connections, and to enable cost-effective future technology public-private partnerships with major research and educational institutions, regional broadband service providers, and large employers. So I want to acknowledge the work also of my colleagues, council members Katz and Friedson on this item. The GEO committee did approve the staff recommendations. Um, and basically there were three uh, recommendations. Number one, we did adopt, uh, approve the uh, recommendation of what the executive has set forward, which was $5,722,000 for fiber net program in FY22. Um, and uh, so we did approve that. We also uh, are going to uh, get a briefing from OMB because we would like for them to provide us a pathway that reduces the dependence of FiberNet, a project on which many departments and agencies depend, as I said, on cable plan revenues, uh, which are diminishing uh, over time, and to develop a broader base of revenues. And this is something that this committee has discussed for quite a while. Um, so we really need to get that draft um, with options uh, and recommendations from the executive. We did request this last year, and that request still stands because this is an issue uh, of concern in terms of how we're going to continue to fund this very important project. And also we are asking the ITPCC, which is an interagency technology uh, working group, um, to um, for their work program element regarding FiberNet 3 implementation at the next committee briefing. So we're going to work on those issues in terms of just general briefings um, to discuss the future of this very important uh, project. Um, with that, that is our basically our recommendation. Uh, and unless uh, Dr. Uh, Torregos has anything else to add, uh, this is what the committee has uh, decided and what is in front of you. Uh, just just very quickly, the fact that uh, kudos go to uh, Ms. Rover and her staff because FiberNet 3 is now a reality. By the end of this year, we're going to have uh, a tenfold increase in the capacity within the current budget. So it's just nothing short of uh, magnificent what Ms. Rover has been able to do. So kudos to Ms. Rover. That's all. Kudos to Ms. Rover. Kudos to Ms. Rover. <laughs> Okay, I don't see any requests to speak. I think, oh, Council Member Rice, you're muted. Just, just very, very quickly, I, I, I really want to thank uh, you, Chair Navarro, and the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee, uh, because many of you know I chair the uh, Broadband Task Force for the National Association of Counties, and I'm oftentimes sharing the success uh, that we've been able to garner here in terms of really advancing uh, broadband access uh, for more people here in this county. Uh, and so we set a model example. So, Director Roper, you hit the ground running. I remember when we first met. And so just want to thank you for that. But then also, this is really important for my colleagues, just, just so they understand. I mean, sometimes we gloss over this, this kind of stuff. And this is something when we talk about a game changer in the pandemic and we talk about economic recovery for our uh, folks in our community, this is what it's about. I mean, when we talk about e-commerce and people setting up small businesses, all the things that we know that we care about. And so Director Roper, Ms. Herrera, uh, Director Tregas, and everybody else, all of your staff, you guys continue to fire on all cylinders. And so thank you for making sure that we're set up for success. I just really wanted to say that. And thank you, of course, to the leadership with government operations, fiscal policy, and all the members. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We have a committee recommendation. I don't see any objections. I think I think we're all set on this one. Thank you all so much for all your hard work. I think we can move on to the Ultra Montgomery project. Uh, Geo Chair Novato. Yep. Uh, so the Ultra Montgomery project provides for capital funding to support economic development and technology leadership in the county. There's a $680,000 request. Um, and it supports planning, engineering, and design and construction of high speed connections along Route 29, White Oak, and along the planned Purple Line, as well as connections to the Ashburn Virginia data centers and global internet hubs for county businesses. Um, we, um, the committee um, did uh, discuss this and approved uh, the uh, request from the county executive. 
but we also um, discussed the need to refocus the effort of the project on making broadband accessible and affordable to all residents. Um, we specifically spoke about the need to um, uh, focus this to the underprivileged sectors of the county and also to develop measurable indicators of performance and success and establish targets for FY22 for the capital infrastructure efforts uh, and also match with similar refocus effort of the opening of the FY22 budget for Ultra Montgomery. Um, we also did, you know, request that a new plan be developed for those $680,000 allocation and that be provided to the full council. And also um, make sure that, of course, all the issues around racial equity and social justice and everything that we have learned throughout this pandemic, that we take that into consideration as we um, become even more innovative uh, in our approach to all of these issues. Um, obviously, a lot of that has just been, uh, I think, just imposed on all of us during the pandemic. Um, so that is the recommendation from the um, Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee. Terrific. I don't see any objections or questions. It looks like a powerful committee recommendation. I think we can move on. Very powerful. Okay, um, great. Now to general government, economic development, and the Kid Museum project. Let me turn it over to Fed Committee Chair, Councilmember Reamer. Thank you so much. Uh, we will go through this a uh, few items in this packet here. Um, the first is the White Oak Sciences Gateway. Um, the county executive has uh, recommended that we adjust the timing of the county's expenditure in that project. Uh, that is to match the expected timing of the private sector developer. Um, and we are all uh, awaiting and, and requesting that the uh, private sector partner move forward. Uh, we, we, uh, we did talk a bit about the significant policy that we adopted in the subdivision staging policy to exempt opportunity zones from impact taxes and how that is a game changer for the economics of, of redeveloping in White Oak. And so we're, we're eager to see some forward motion there. And we also want to see some executive branch focus. Uh, you know, this has come up in some other contexts as well, but uh, we, we wanted to follow up at the committee and we will uh, just a little bit you know, separately just to better understand how both the Economic Development Corporation and the county government are tackling this uh, with, with the uh, enthusiasm that it needs to be tackled. Because, uh, you know, having a gravel lot uh, there is, uh, you know, not what we're going for. So, um, so we adjusted that item. The Wheaton Redevelopment Program uh, just had some fairly you know, miscellaneous adjustments in its timing. The uh, project has been a great success. I know we can't, we all can't wait to be able to uh, attend a meeting there um, in the near future as that begins to hopefully reopen. And then um, finally, the, uh, the Kid Museum. And uh, my colleagues will recall a number of years ago, we added funding to the capital budget to support uh, the expansion of the Kid Museum in the county uh, to support their um, acquisition of a facility. And um, that particular facility ended up not being viable, but we, we worked hard to keep that funding in the budget. And uh, that has paid off because the Kid Museum, after a number of different uh, you know, options, has found a, a second location um, and they're careful to say they hope to have a third and a fourth, you know, location uh, in the future. But they are they are taking on a lease uh, at the uh, at the site of uh, where Street Sense was at the Bethesda Metro. Uh, so they'll be at Davis Library, which is sort of mid county, uh, Bethesda Metro down county. And uh, again, we'll hope to get them uh, to up county and east county. Uh, you know, as they continue their expansion. But I want to thank the county executive and the team at OMB and, and uh, you know, wherever this was uh, negotiated, uh, we appreciate your support to uh, shift this funding. The, the, the essence of this capital fund program here is we're shifting funding from a sort of a stockpile of, of bond revenue to more of an operating expense. 
and uh, certainly want to salute my my colleagues. Uh, you know, Council Member Albernos worked with Kid Museum starting I don't know seven eight years ago or some something whenever that enterprise began. And Council Member Rice uh, has been a champion through the Ed Committee, and uh, and you know Council Member Navarro. Uh, so many so many of you. Council Member Friedson. I, I don't know. I could call all of your names. I, I probably should. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you to all of you. It's an exciting step for them. And, uh, you know, they're not done yet. So in any event, that's this budget item. Uh, it shifts the funding and they're, they're going to, you know, I'll, I will say the, what has been exciting is they have forged a remarkable partnership with MCPS. And MCPS, of course, is an amazing institution that operates at a scale that is hard to even understand at times. And when they, when MCPS and the Kid Museum get together, just like magic is happening. And they've been a big part of the virtual learning environment shift. And, you know, I, they should be a big part of our uh, kind of accelerating learning and, and recovery learning strategy in the next couple of years. So exciting foundations have been built and, um, you know, we're, we're gonna make some strides here. So uh, with that, we have the committee's recommendations, uh, which are, uh, laid out in the documents. Gene, did I did I miss anything? No, other than that, the Wheaton, um, which is a geo and Fed item, both the chairs noted that this could go straight to council due just as a funding acceleration. So that was not reviewed in committees, but the other two that you just noted, the Kid Museum and White Oak, did come with a Fed committee recommendation. That's why I was searching my memory and coming up with blanks and trying to pretend otherwise. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. So we have our committee recommendation and our joint committee recommendation as well. Great. Council Vice President Albernos. Thanks. Just very quickly, I um, just want to underscore the great comments regarding KID. We've all been bullish and have seen the possibilities that have been coming to fruition now for seven years. They are a treasure in our community, uh, certainly worthy of greater investment. And as we identify an anchor location for them, you know, having a world-class children's museum here in our own community, but it's not just brick and mortar, as uh, Council Member Reamer noted. The partnership with MCPS is unbelievable, uh, groundbreaking, frankly. Uh, and it's one of the areas that we should all be extraordinarily proud of. And I know all of us have been working hard on this. And Carr and her team are just outstanding. So, and I certainly agree with all of the other committee recommendations. Thank you. Council Member Friedson. Yeah, I'll just echo those comments. I'll be very brief here. Uh, the first is uh, we haven't put uh, the quantitative on this. It's been qualitative and the quality of the Kid Museum and the type of access to education and experiential learning that's going to provide young people is uh, tremendous. Uh, but this was going to allow them to reach 100,000 students through MCPS. And the scale of that and what this is going to provide uh, is so significant for so many people, COVID has uh, both uh, expanded the gaps and the challenges that we face in so many areas, in, 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 including uh, on these, but it has also accelerated the need for maker and coding and the type of talent development that Kid Museum is gonna help provide our young people uh, to be really successful parts of our local and regional economy moving forward. And this is really gonna to help to bridge that gap, both from an economic standpoint, from an equity uh, standpoint, uh, and from an access standpoint. And I just wanted to credit the executive branch and MCPS uh, and uh, Carla Lesser and her team and Robbie Brewer and the board at, at Kid Museum. This is an ultimate partnership between the county council, county executive, MCPS, uh, and one of our treasured nonprofit partners and hundreds of thousands of young people over the next several years are going to benefit from it and the county ultimately and our economy and uh, realizing the full potential of our young people uh, are gonna benefit uh, as well. So just really excited about this, really appreciate uh, the collaboration and coordination and think this is going to be a really exciting way that we come out of this pandemic stronger and better uh, than when we entered it. Okay. Uh, so we have a committee recommendation and a joint committee recommendation. I don't see any objections. I think that's adopted. Uh, now we can move on to general government economic development, I'm sorry, to uh, 
county offices and other improvements. Let me turn it over to Geo Chair Novato. Thank you so much. Um, so for this um, particular item, I want to uh, thank Mr. Mia and Ms. Rodriguez Hernandez. Uh, staff members who prepared the packet. Also want to thank Mr. Geis, Mr. Hassan, Ms. Beck, uh, and also Mr. Naldine who participated in this session. In terms of uh, just the summary of the recommendations, um, the uh, committee uh, approved uh, $500,000 for council office building renovations. There was a cost increase due to revised scope renovation of space to accommodate the 11 member council for the asbest, uh, asbestos abatement. Um, there was a reduction of $1,000. Facility planning from Montgomery County government, acceleration into FY20. There was um, a, a reduction of $23,000. Energy systems modernizations, there was a funding switch, which we approved, EOB HVAC renovation, there was a reduction of excess appropriation, red brick courthouse structural repairs, there was a reduction of excess appropriation in ADA compliance, there was a funding shift from FY23 to 24 to FY24 to 25. Um, let me also just briefly uh, summarize some of the discussions we had in terms of the COB renovation. Uh, the cost increase of $500,000, mostly covered by a $92,000 appropriation that we made on March 16th. Um, also, it would add um, that $92,000 to the COB renovation project for the creation of office space for the two additional council members. Overall increase in project costs expected to be 500,000, but 408,000 were covered by previous excess appropriations. The space currently occupied by LIS on the fourth floor would be converted into two suites for council member offices behind a secure door with an option to create a secure floor similar to how the fifth, fifth floor is set up. LIS would be relocated to the sixth floor, the Tuxent River conference room fourth floor copier Copier would be relocated to a new location on the fourth floor, and DJ, DGS is looking to replace conference space located in the cafeteria as the proposed base uh, um, of this project. DGS looked into several other options as well, including redesigning fifth floor and converting the cafeteria space into new offices, but other options are being considered, were considered too disruptive and potentially too expen expensive. Um, the estimated completion is October 2022. Proposed next phase of renovations, kitchen cafeteria, estimated cost $1 million. Uh, those funds are not appropriated yet. Um, trying to get the facility, of course, up to code, and that could potentially be used to uh, rework the space, maybe converting into a grab-and-go model in partnership with local restaurants. Therefore, hearing room also being upgraded to accommodate additional council members in addition to previously approved a, um HBA, I think, AD system upgrades, and DGS recommends adding a refurbishment of the seventh floor hearing room to the list of projects currently unable to accommodate 11 council members. Um, so that is just a summary, and um, I know that there has been an addition, I believe, a new a um, item, ADA compliance, so maybe staff can uh, talk about that, and also, of course, we do have Mr. Dice here and Mr. Assant, if there are any other particulars um, to be discussed, but everything else is very much um, uh, described in detail in the packet. So, uh, thank you for the summary, Chair Navarro. Um, yeah, just to note, uh, there was one amendment that came over on March 15th. Um, that was the ADA compliance project. It shifted $1 million each from FY23 and 24 to FY25 and 26. There was a typo in the packet, so I just want to clarify that. Um, it's a it's a non controversial change. Um, it's a level of effort project, and typically um, in CIP budgets, we, we do shift funds from LOEs projects like that uh, to balance the CIP. So, uh, staff recommends uh, approval of that change. Okay, so that is an addition that the committee did not um, discuss, but it's here for full council. Okay, colleagues, do we support the committee recommendation with that staff recommendation? An amendment? Getting a lot of nods and thumbs up. Okay, Mr. Dice, Mr. Hassan, uh, everybody, uh, very nice to see you. Thank you, Ms. Beck. Thanks for all your hard work on this. It's terrific. I think we're at the end of this agenda. Miraculously, before we adjourn, I do want to wish uh, long-suffering council spouse Angela Reamer 
and her lucky husband a very happy 19th wedding anniversary. Apparently, there's nothing else on Netflix, and so she actually might be watching this. So uh, happy anniversary, Angela, and thanks for sharing, Hans, with all of our residents. Happy anniversary, Hans. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Thank you so Hans much. Hans is taking happy her out to Del Frisco's today. I'm going to say, she deserves several awards, several awards. <laughs> Going to Little League first. Thank you very much, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. We are adjourned. Thank